This episode is supported by Battlefilm.com. Anime cyberpunk style meets skirmish combat in Infinity. Experience eight high-tech factions and fight to control the human sphere at the Infinity Hub on BeastsOfWar.com. From Viking halls to the cities of the future, terrain buffs will love our foreground hub. Watch gaming tables of all genres come to life at BeastsOfWar.com. Good morning and welcome to The Weekender. Right, we have a jam-packed episode. Um, first, some housekeeping stuff. Yep. Okay. So next week is Hobby Night Live. Yes. Okay. Um, we are going to be uh, doing a, a Hobby Night on Thursday starting at 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. Don't worry, we'll be doing lots of vlogging and stuff next week on the run-up to this because we have loads that we need to test mm. and uh, to get working properly to hopefully have a complete, uninterrupted stream. Of, yes. of awesomeness. Yes. What we're going to be doing on our side, because remember, Hobby Night Live is a two-way thing. It's all about the projects that you're working on, mm -hmm. and then on the night we have, we pick a project that we're working on, mm -hmm. and then we're, we've got uh, Ben in, and we're going to be talking about some of the other bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be about four hours, mm -hmm. kicking off at uh, 8 p.m. You'll be able to contact the show uh, either using the, the chat that mm -hmm. will be embedded, the, the, the Twitch chat, yep. um, or uh, by Twitter. Twitter's cool because you come up on... on on, on my pad thing, mm -hmm. um, so I can I can see what you're doing. Uh, we'll have Ben monitoring uh, the the community comments and things like that. They're getting involved. Lance is going to be kind of controller of the show. He'll also be monitoring it. Mm -hmm. The rest of us are all going to be working on the plans for our ultimate Viking table, mm -hmm. 28 mil Viking awesomeness mm -hmm. based on the Viking TV series. So we're going to try and build our version of Kattegat. Mm. Uh, on the gaming table. Um, so this will be the planning night um, where we're going to be trying some bits of experiments, drawing things out, getting all of your opinions, mm. doing some layouts, doing our to-do lists and just having a lot of banter back and forth mm. and also talking about the projects that you guys are working on and bringing them up on screen and showing them to all of our other community members. Mm. We also will be giving away the first of our brand new The Ultimate the most important prize ever, okay? Mm -hmm. And we have gave away, I would say by this stage, we have given away tens of thousands of pounds mm -hmm. of prizes. Perhaps even more, because like, perhaps even more. We, we, we must be well up. We must be approaching nearly 100 grand's worth of prizes over the last yep. 10 years that we have given away. Yeah. All right, or last, whatever, nine years. That's just this this single prize... Mm. Eclipses all of it. Because money cannot buy this Money prize. cannot buy this prize. Mm. And everybody, and I mean everybody of any significance in the industry, mm. has been in contact pleading with us <laughs> to give them one. <laughs> and we've told them all the f <laughs> <laughs> The only way well, you can up, win it, word. it is the Hobby God bag. Yeah, pick up the bag. And so uh, 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 the bag is on screen. Hopefully, <laughs> we, we've been sent photographs of the prototype of the bag. Mm. This bag took, uh, it, you know, it took generations to create this bag mm. because it took all the generations of my family, all the generations of his family, all the generations of Caesar, the ultimate cartoonist's family, and all the generations of Annie from Cozy Dice who hand crafts see every one of them stitches. She did every one of them with a needle and thread, man. You know, these, these, are, these are the ultimate, ultimate bags, the ultimate prize. And the only way you'd be able to get your hands on one of these bags mm -hmm. is by winning it, by being the ultimate hobbyist, the hobby god yep. of that particular hobby night life. Yes. Right. Okay. Are we going to have to do a little certificate of authenticity? <sighs> You won't need one, man. When you walk around with one of these bags, yeah. okay, men, women, and animals will swoon at your feet. <laughs> they will, they will, everybody is just going to swoon when you're walking around with one of these bags. That's how, that's how can awesome these bags are, mm. okay? All right. Right. What it does mean, however, though, is there's no weekend or next weekend. Yes. Because Hobby Night Live... Places. Replaces it. It is four hours of replacement. So if you don't catch it on the night, mm. um, you can watch it over uh, over the course of the weekend. Mm. 
but we also have a, an actual replacement for you because we're kicking off a board game week. So the mm. Beast of War team um, got together uh, with Devere Games, mm -hmm. and we have spent we have a week of board gaming entertainment. Mm. Where we've been playing a bunch of games like yes. Fan Hunter, Sherlock Holmes, Dragons and Chickens. That was fun. Checkpoint Charlie. That was really and fun. Miguel Strogoff, which is a very interesting game. Mm -hmm. So we have, um, we have five days of board gaming, which are going to kick off on Saturday the twenty seventh of May. Mm -hmm. uh, then we're going to run through Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, mm -hmm. and then um, on the on the Thursday and Friday we're we're gearing up to be live blogging from the, the UK's games, yeah. largest um, yeah. gaming expo, and that is UK Games Expo. I'm so, really looking forward to see it this year. I'm really curious about it. So if you're, if you're wondering what you're going to do, if you've caught Hobby Night Live, um, what you're going to do with your Saturday and Sunday, don't you worry, because we're going to have some awesome board game playthroughs kicking off on the Saturday and the Sunday, and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So we have, we have you covered. Yes. Right. Uh, Couple of uh, competition winners to announce. Yes, we do. So uh, last week on the weekender, we were giving away a deluxe load pledge from the Reload Kickstarter, mm -hmm. right? So that was a winner of Lobster Mooch is our winner. Congratulations, Congratulations dear Jammy Dance with Pride. Yep. We then had a Simon Expo swag bag up for grabs. So we did a live blog for Simon Expo. Mm -hmm. Don and Gianna over in the states did a fantastic job. Showed off some great gaming over the weekend and. Our winner is Emptiness is Form, who has won in this bag. I've got a little list here of what's in the bag. So, some Rum and Bones goodies, Blood Rage Extras, Zombie Side promos, Small Box Game Expansions and Promo Packs, Arcadia Quest promos, Wrath of Kings alt characters, Xeno Shift Playmat, uh, Zombie Side Black. A couple whoa, of Zombie whoa, whoa. Side Black Plague in there as well. Yeah, I got to the end. I was just like, <laughs> what? <Yeah. laughs> I thought my house went for a second. That is absolutely Congratulations, nuts. mate. <laughs> right. Um, uh, congratulations, Emptiness is Form. Yes. Um, I, I, I think you're a long-time member of Beast of War, actually. So, uh, so well done, mate. You yeah. are you are a winner. Um, right. Final um, mm. final kind of uh, update. On Monday the 29th, um, we are going to be launching our second Global Infinity campaign yep. called Strike Zone Wotan. Yes. Now... Um, just to give you, see, I don't want to give away too many details of the campaign because that, that's what Monday's all about. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, for, uh, for community members, new members and stuff like that there, just to, to bring you up to speed. Beast of War, we, uh, over the, the last couple of years, we've been developing a global campaign platform. Mm -hmm. okay? It's called War Console. And um, we, we've, run, we've run some campaigns in the past. So uh, we run uh, the Operation Flamestrike, which was a huge campaign yeah. um, uh, based in the, yeah. in didn't, the world didn't of Infinity. Work out how many miniatures would actually be taller than the tallest building if you put point per miniature, end to end per yeah, miniature? Yeah, the, the, the number of miniatures, it was, it was taller than the the Some, the Burj the, the uh, Burj Dubai, the, Dubai was it? yeah the Burj <laughs> yeah. in Dubai so it it, it was it, it was huge so uh, anyway we have we have a new campaign which is going to be launching on Monday it takes place in space this mm. one so uh, the Infinity factions have their own kind of space stations and spaceships and mm -hmm. you're going to be vying for control of all of these space stations and spaceships it is an evolving storyline over the course of the eight week campaign. Mm -hmm. Um, I just wanted to uh, draw uh, attention to uh, some some kind of new things that we've worked on on War Console. So War Console itself is a platform that allows players uh, from all over the world mm -hmm. to get involved in a campaign and fight over territories and stuff. Its whole basis is about allowing you to create cool battle reports. Yeah. Okay. So you can upload some awesome videos. You can uh, link in your videos. You can put in your battle text, and then your other players, your your other uh, community members who are involved in the campaign, can come in and give you commendations and things like that. Yeah. And what you can end up doing is unlocking cool achievements, unlocking XP, which then unlocks ranks. Mm -hmm. So you can start to to go up through the ranks and things. It's a it's a cool system, um, uh, it, but we have some new additions. So for any of you guys who are thinking uh, about getting involved in 
uh, strike zone Wotan. Mm -hmm. um, we have we have some new updates that I just wanted to warn you in advance about. Uh, the first one is that we've uh, done a bit of an overhaul of how the actual battle reports themselves are constructed. Mm -hmm. So um, whereas before it used to be um, you could put in some text, you could upload images, and it was all kind of separate from one another. We've now kind of introduced a block or a chunk format. Okay, right. So you can now create a title. You can then create an image. Uh -huh. And you then can create a block of text. You can ah, then create so you, another image. So you can just... Ah. And then as well as that, you can also click little up and down arrows to move these blocks up and down to reorder them. So you can so, build it as you want it. Nice. So we've given, we're, we've given you what we, we hope is, is a much more flexible way of laying out the battle reports the way you want to. Mm. And, you know, and in the future, we'll add in other functionality and stuff in that. Like, who knows, you, you could even add in like a poll or, or, mm. or a question or, or something. Yeah. I, I don't know. We, we, we'll see how it goes. And do we still um, have all of the old features in there as well, I'm guessing? Yeah, you can link, you can link battle reports. Mm. So if you and an opponent are both registered in this system, yeah. you can link your battle reports together. So yep. whoever creates their battle report, they can get a, a link code that they mm. can then provide to their opponent. Ah. Your opponent puts that in. It links the battle reports together, yeah. So that if anybody reading a battle report can link the re the, the read the linked one to mm. see how the other player thought it went, so you get both <laughs> sides of the story. Interesting. And it unlocks extra experience points and, nice. and things like that for nice. you as well. And then you'll obviously have your your faction forums where all the commanders can get together, plan strikes, where they want yes. to plan missions we have, and stuff. We have all those faction uh, individual faction forums um, where you can go in. And you can uh, discuss your plans and stuff like that. Bear in mind, there will be spies. You can't stop them. There is no way of stopping a spy. That's the whole point of a spy. Mm. So, you know, some people might register uh, other accounts to go in there. But that's okay. Use the fact that there's spies in there. So, mm. you know, you can post all sorts of disinfo and, and whatever you want. Oh, so hang on. If you discover who a spy is... Try and send disinformation to them. Yeah, you, oh. you start working on disinformation. That's and stuff interesting. Like. There's lots of fun ways. The, the idea is that we're just we're just providing a platform that gives you a realistic kind of uh, mm. a, a basis of where to, to to host a giant war. Yeah, and that and that's so that that's what it's all about. Another feature that we have um, that we have added is is quite special this year, and it's um it's for the ability for um, stores and clubs mm. to be created within the system. Okay. Ah. So what happens is um, you can you can create a free account, okay, and then you can create basically a, a store or a club, mm. okay. Then other members can search for your store or club, and they can either look for it on a map, yeah, um, or they can search for it, and then they can join your store or club. And then their results, all the results of people who have joined your store or club, yeah. get aggregated into a very special page just for that store or club. And it becomes like a snapshot mm. of the campaign, but just of the activity within that store or club. So, so you're, it's like, you're a strike team. It's, well, it's like your mini version of the campaign. Yeah. So you can see what's going on over uh, globally, worldwide, but you can also have a mini version of the campaign running within your club or your store That's that nice. is only affected by the results of those who are within your club. That's nice. Store. It gives you that more granular look at it. Yeah. It's very cool. It's a great way for stores um, to uh, you know, uh, get players to, to come and, and, and to visit. We're hoping that people will be able to, to find new places and new, play, uh, new clubs. So will there actually be a, an Earth map then showing where these we, clubs we are located? We have a Google Earth map oh. with all the stores all pinpointed. So you nice. can zoom in and find, find stores and clubs that are That's near That's a good you. idea. Um, we also have lists so you can search for it. And each store, uh, store slash club page, mm. um, as well as having um, all of the little charts for the theatres just based on the points um, and the games from your store, mm. we also filter out that you'll only see the battle reports from people in that store. Right. And we filter out league tables. So the league tables for the people uh, who compete just within that store. See, so I... it's like a micro version of the campaign. See, that this is something I like because you might get two clubs that are pretty close together having a bit of a rivalry seeing who's doing better. You, know, you, you could, you know, it's, um, uh, there's, there's, there's no specific ranking between stores and clubs just yet. Mm. It's more about what takes place within a store or a club. Mm. The other thing you can do actually is you can actually upload photographs mm. of your store and your club. That's nice. And then they automatically embed in the header and they fade through and stuff oh, like that's that. Cool. There. That's so, cool. um, 
it's just to give you guys a bit of advance notice who are going to be getting involved in Strike Zone Wotan that mm. um, uh, the, the, the system is kind of going back into beta a little bit because of that. There's a lot that. of... There's, well, there's a lot of new code involved, and um, there's not much new code involved in the in the the core kind of calculations and stuff like that. So everything should be fine from mm. that perspective. Um, but there, but bear in mind, and if anybody's ranting and raving that, that that something isn't working, you can explain to them. We've added in um, a, a bunch of new functionality now. Mm. Um, so there 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 may be some things that that go a bit skew if. Mm. Um, early on in the campaign, uh, we'll be hopping on to fix that. Other things that we find sometimes in the campaign is we have devise we devise a system based on a data structure, yeah. but it gets busy, and then we notice that it starts to slow down. Mm. Um, we've tried to mitigate that as best as we can, but it's very difficult to stress test some of these things outside of a real world example. Yeah. Um, so if things start to slow down, it means that we have to refactor things. We know we can do it, but sometimes it just takes a bit of time. But again, it, none of it is related to um, the the core kind of calculations and things like that. So I would imagine, I would imagine, if there's things that we're tweaking, fixing, improving upon during this, it should be fairly under the radar for you guys. You shouldn't you shouldn't notice much. But I want to put that caveat out there that when we do add in, um new features and new abilities for the war console platform somebody's got to be the guinea pig to use it first and uh, it will be you guys in mm. strike zone wotan but it should be great the graphics the graphics in this one is are <laughs> i mean stop teasing gutier <laughs> it, it it just exploded gutier has spent ages crafting a storyline mm -hmm. for this one uh, crafting graphics you know the the Corvus Belly team have really got to grips with the platform now, mm -hmm. and you know I, I just see these campaigns going from strength to strength in terms of their in terms of their their depth, their engagement, and uh, the 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 fun that that you that you get out of it and and get out of participating, mm -hmm. and and that's what it's all about. So we'll be very much again in the background trying to uh, tweak things, keep things uh, up and running. Mm -hmm. Corvus Belly should be hopping on. To update you with your news and things like that um, in the in the front end, the news has been upgraded as well. And it now has a kind of like a timeline kind of a look. Ah. So, as major things kind of happen through the campaign, we're we're hoping the team at Corvus Belly will be able to write up some cool write ups based on that. Something from the war that will be yeah. put in, and then anybody coming into the system can kind of follow along with the timeline. There might be featured battle reports and things mm -hmm. like that in there, cool. and it all kind of builds up so you can start to get the sense of a story rather than it just being kind of a news outlet. So there's, there's quite a bit that we've been working on and changing uh, since the last one. That wraps me up. Mm -hmm. That wraps me up. Right, Justin. Yes. We have the Foreground guys in. Um, yeah, well, I have Cad from Foreground in because okay. we've had the guys from Foreground over this week getting a closer look at the Legend of Fabled Realms. Mm -hmm. now, this is a game that has me really excited because it's got such a beautiful build to its mechanics Really great narrative behind the world, and in this section, we're going to be getting a sneak peek at one of the new factions. So that'll be, if I make sure I get it right here, it will be the Mordenburg Guard. Now this is the work in progress miniatures with myself and Kaz, so we'll take a quick hub break, and we'll be right back. It's time for 28mm World War II action. Will you recreate history or reshape it your way? On the Bolt Action Hub at beastsofwar.com. Fame and fortune awaits in blood and plunder. Set sail in the golden age of piracy and claim the riches of the Caribbean at beastsofwar.com. Hi everybody, we have had the foreground guys in all week and I couldn't have you guys in and not get you on for a weekender segment. So, uh, as you can guess, we're going to be teasing more stuff for the Legends of Field Realms, perhaps by the sign in the background, perhaps by the... This in front of us. What is this? <laughs> that is a Dorian legionary helmet. Okay. Um, so this is the the stuff that the guys used to wear before they were Dragoon and Dragoi. Right. Uh, and some of them still do wear uh, now. So Alia has a helmet very similar to that. Okay. Uh, the legionaries were the basic soldiers. So this is a munition piece of armor. Okay. So that's why it's all unlike uh, Alia's. It's not articulated. Okay. Um, well, he's nodding his head right now. He, he is. He with agrees you. with me. Uh, may I lift it? Yeah, of course you can. Oh my god, it's heavy. <laughs> Did, 
How did you guys get this made? Uh, a friend of ours um, called Alistair. Yeah. He's a blacksmith, right. and uh, he used to do it for reenactors. Uh -huh. And he now just does it for pubs. <laughs> right, I, I'm going to do this just because it's a giggle. This may hurt. And you may not be able to hear me, or I may sound very ugly, but here is Justin uh, Dorian. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God, that's heavy. Oh, that would break your neck if you were wearing it all day. <laughs> well, your neck muscles would get a lot bigger. You'd, be, you'd look like the Hulk <laughs> by the end of it. Oh. Um, so he's got his neck protection. Yeah, I'll not try well. that. No? I'll not try the gore it. Cause I'm, is it for... Dorian as well, or is that uh, something no, else? No, this is to show you kind of what the eightfold path would wear. Okay. So oh, that would be across your neck. Yeah. I'm not going to put it on because the microphone won't like it. <laughs> um, but, yeah. So these are a couple of bits we have around the office. Yeah. Um, See, th it's this nice bits like this. You're, you'll put that on a stand somewhere, and someone's like, what's with the armor? Is that? That's real. Yeah. And then you can actually start telling them about it. And then I see the, the chain mail is authentically rusty. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the uh, Dragoi don't really keep, keep much care of their armour. Mm. So if you look, the front of his helmet has actually started rusting as well. Yeah, yeah, there's a, a nice patina on that. <laughs> it's really cool to actually get something like that made for a game, because that's just, it, fine. It, it's got no use in real life. No. It's a nice showpiece, though. It's all right if the zombies happen. <laughs> but, uh, well, yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> Are you going to do a full suit? Uh, we're thinking about it. We've been talking to Alistair about it. Uh, uh, put him to the front of the table. Oh. Yeah, there's a possibility of doing... But another one of our friends, the guy that did the... Um... Hang on. Hang on. There we yeah. go. Sorry, I just wanted to make that still. That was, it was annoying me just going, yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes. Just agrees with everything I say. Yeah. Yes, make me a full suit of armour. Yeah. <laughs> See, you probably put this into Big Ben's office and say, should we make this building? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Hey, the helmet says yes. Oh no, that that could end up badly. You never know what buildings you'd end up with. <laughs> uh, well, uh, we are here to talk Fabled Realms, mm -hmm. uh, which is the important thing because it will be coming to Kickstarter in the near future. Yes. And as you'll have seen, we've shown you the full path. Mm -hmm. We have shown you the Dragul work in progress, which yeah. Uh, oh, the, I've see, I've had the done minis in my hand this weekend. Oh my god, they're so beautiful. They are very. They've oh. come across very well from uh, 3D renders to sculpt. Yeah, and uh, they just oh the the character of them is fantastic. But we have more characters to show you. So this is for one of the other factions that's going to be a stretch goal in the Kickstarter. Yeah. yeah. So this is the Mordenberg State Guard. They're the more regimented army. Uh, these are the first five minis. Uh huh. So in the set, you'll actually end up with two of the archers. And three of the halberdiers, and like the eightfold path and the um, dragoi, they won't be the same miniature. You won't end up with two of that archer and three of that halberdier. Yeah, these are work in progress. Yeah, I, want, so, I was about to put that caveat in there because you will, I, I can see the points that you still need to work on. Yeah, you will see sort of uh, square shapes on them, mm -hmm. things like um, the helmets, the hats. helmets, hats. Uh, the, in this picture, the archer's armor. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, let's let's move along a little bit. Let's have a look at that archer because that's quite the interesting one. Yeah. So she's called Rebecca. Uh, she's a female archer. Ah, I, I did. I didn't think this was a woman. Yeah. And, okay, this is nice. I like this. True yeah. world armor. I like it. Yeah. Um, it's one of the things that that we definitely wanted as part of of the world is that. Um, the armor has to be, or the clothing has to be usable. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, she's got, and she's even got a little buckler. Yep, and um, a little dagger, I'm guessing. And a little dagger, and she's uh, the, all of them have a backstory. Mm -hmm. So if you look, she's actually got a journal on her belt. Yeah, uh, I, can, I can see it here. That's because she likes to keep a journal. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of her pastimes, and she also does the company's accounts. So ah. even though she's only a henchman, yeah, she has her own story. Mm -hmm. It makes a lot of sense that th these people would have a backstory. This is not just yeah. Faceless Swordsman number two, Faceless arch Archer number three. I like this. All right, so the next one is one of my favorites from the set. We have a Nomian wizard. And this yeah. little guy looks awesome. So he, he's from the Nunsuch University, mm -hmm. which is the big university in Mordenberg. Yeah. Um, he's a good friend to the leader of the war band. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look, he's got um, his bottles and potions. Yeah. Um, he's we've got, got a little overflowing satchel there. Yeah, fill, filled with more scrolls. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's reading from his book. This is the um, sculptor who gave us two potential poses for mm -hmm. him. So we're, we're picking between the two. Yeah, of course. Uh, um, so this is one of the two poses, yeah? I know that if you look at the top in the center, there uh, is a second pose. 
So one of them uh, is so with his hand, up, yeah, or uh, pointing, pointing up. Forward. So at the moment, the consensus we're getting is pointing up. I was about to say pointing up, but uh, yeah, everybody get your you know get your votes in on that one or your comments in below to see which one you like. I'm sure the foreground guys are always looking at the comments. Yeah, definitely. Um, we, there are a lot of feedback mm -hmm. about the other sculpts, mm -hmm. um, and it was really good to get them because some of them we could actually ask questions of yeah. the sculptors about. Yeah, well, actually, th okay, this one looks familiar. Uh, he does. His name is Bill. Um, okay. Not quite Ben. He's a veteran. He's been in the Mordenberg State Guard for a while. Yeah. Uh, he's getting too old for this, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Uh, I'm, I'm, there, I have those days in the office now where I'm just like, I'm too old for this. <laughs> and then I remember, wait, I play games. <laughs> uh, and uh, he shows you uh, the standard um, henchmen mm. for the Mordenberg State Guard mm. will be halberdiers and bowmen. Mm. Um, and the halberdiers, uh, you'll find out when, when you get to watch some of the demo games, yeah. halberds can be very powerful against people in heavy armour. Yeah. So he's quite good at opening tin cans. Yeah. See, what I like about this is there's a real feel that this is a real soldier, right? Yeah. Because uh, sometimes you'll see people, they'll sculpt a soldier and it's, you know, is the big buff Arnie body on him, right? Mm -hmm. This looks like a guy who's been in the army for maybe three or four decades. He's been through every war, every campaign. Yeah. You know, they've had to reshape the breastplate to be a belly plate. <laughs> uh, but it's, it feels like uh, someone who was actually in the army because he feels like a bigger guy than mm -hmm. your average, you know, everyday person from around. Your little cell sword with daggers and stuff. Yeah. You know, it, it feels like the body that's built for the job. Oh, trying to say that. <laughs> okay, next up. Oh, hello. We have uh, Ork. Yeah, so this is our um, the leader of the faction uh -huh. um, for the starter set. He's um, called... Oh, I've forgotten his name. Oh, Sorry about that. Oh, uh, then we've got two Orcs um, okay. in the starter set. Uh -huh. um, we've got Rafa, who, which is the one that I kept thinking about, who's a sellsword character, which right. we'll be showing you later. Yeah. And we've got this guy. Uh, he's... Um, He's had to fight a lot of prejudice mm -hmm. um, because the Mordenberg State Guard used to be very anti-promotion um, through achievement. They weren't a meritocracy. If you had enough money, you could buy your um, commission. commission. Yeah. Um, Grimwald, who's now the High Marshal and is also an Orc, mm -hmm. um, he uh, put in some reforms. Mm -hmm. And one of those was people were promoted on merit rather than... Yeah, uh, their their money. Yeah, uh, which means that this guy has become a captain. Mm -hmm. uh, no, this is something that's very different. Yeah, I think orc. I think down dirty bestial greasing up the armor because I think it'll make someone's sword slide off. This is this is quite the civilized orc. Yeah, and uh, he's even you can tell he's very skilled with his sword mm -hmm. uh, because his left ha hand is armored. Uh huh. And that's an armored gauntlet, so he can deflect a blow. Mm -hmm. But his right hand, to give him more dexterity on the sword, is not armored. Yes. And that is specifically so he can get the more finesse with his blade. So he's actually a very cultured, very skilled orc. Okay, now I'm going to ask this because I know you guys love and adore your history. Yeah. Was this something from history? Uh, it's based off of a the some of the stuff that used to happen in the 17th century. Mm -hmm. So um, the left hand would be a bridal hand. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd use that on your your bridal on horseback. Uh -huh. And then uh, 17th century swordsman, he would normally have a gauntlet. Uh -huh. Obviously, it's fantasy, so there is a little bit uh, of twist, change. Yeah. So the orc, he's tough enough that he just does his hand. Mm. Whereas a 17th century guy would be wearing a gauntlet, uh -huh. and they'd have their hand in the basket of the hilt. Uh -huh. So that would allow them to, if a sword comes in, when they're holding their bridle, they can lift their arm up uh -huh. and deflect it. Uh -huh. And they can also fight with their right hand, and they've got their finesse from the glove. Ah, I see. Well, you see, this, it's nice to hear that kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, me, I'm a lefty. So yeah. They would have to make it the other way from They me. would. Will there be anyone that's left-handed? Uh, there already is. Oh, yeah, it's we had this argument, yeah, didn't we? Your, we your did. dad was so mad at me whenever he, I came out of that I know, it was the other way around. It was at me. He's going, <laughs> you should know this. <laughs> All right, so we have one more character here. So who is this? This is Amelia. Uh -huh. She is an apprentice in the Nunsuch University. Mm -hmm. uh, she follows uh, the style of water magic. Uh-huh. So that's why we wanted her in this flowing pose. Yeah. Because some of the things you can do with water magic is you can make it so, um, once again, you'll see in the demo games about how you do spells and things. Mm -hmm. But if you receive a, a certain number of criticals, mm -hmm. you can then ignore dice that are allocated ah. to you. So she can, she can actually become a water form ah. so that you can't hit her. Ah, um, she also has, that's a staff of power. Mm -hmm. 
And what this allows her to do is another ability that you'll come across in the game, which mm. is parry. Ah. So she can make herself very defensive. Mm. It also allows, it gives her, like the wand, it gives her an extra dice for magic. Yeah. So she, she's, um, and she's got, like, her hair's very short because mm. she's a kind of an apprentice. Yeah. And uh, she's trying to do everything she can to keep on top of the fact that the reason she joined the Nunsuch University is because she kept flooding her parents' house. So... <laughs> That's a nice little piece of humour. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just that moment of, darling, look, you keep flooding the house. You're going to have to go and learn to control this. Uh, yes, ma'am. Sorry, ma'am. Yeah, and that's why she's taken up martial arts as well. Mm. Is so that I, was the, gonna, I was thinking that's a very martial art pose. Yeah, well, she's taken it up to help her learn control. Mm. So although it might not have a huge effect on the game, mm. what it is is it's her backstory for that character. So you've got the fact that, like, we wanted her to have that kind of look that her... She's now in control of her abilities. See, it's, it's that great flavour that you're getting into all of the miniatures. Because everybody, yeah. it, they feel real. Yeah, that's what it's we a fantasy world, But it, it feels real. It feels like this person could exist. Those yeah. personality quirks, those, you know, the little things about the stuff they would carry and wear with them. It's, it's so, so granular, so, so detailed. I love the fact that you're going that deep with it. Yeah. Uh, do we have anything else to show? Uh, we do. Uh, we've got with us. Oh, no, reach what's down it, and get what's it. it going for? What's it going for? Uh, we've got a very early sample of the box. Ah. So this was done um, by us on some of the sample mm -hmm. sample boxes we received. This is really nice. So is it going to be like this this book sort of shape, yes? Yeah, it's going to be book shaped. Uh, it's going to be of a bit better quality than that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, so the idea is that internally you will have um, the backstory for all your characters. So I assume that's here? Yeah. And then they're going to be in their VAC form packaging in the, the nice clear window here. Yeah, in the clear window. Mm. So when you go into the shop, you'll be able to open up the book, mm -hmm. read the backstory, mm -hmm. um, have a look inside. And the idea is that my girlfriend, she uh, she's not necessarily overly keen on the amount of boxes of miniatures I have in the house. Yeah. Um, but she was kind of happy at the idea of a load of boxes that look like books on a shelf. Ah. So uh, to to keep her happy, I was like. Do you know I, what I'll I, do? I can hide these yeah. in the bookshelf. And it looks like I have this amazing encyclopedia because uh, <laughs> each of them has on there, on ah. the side, they've got their volume number. Mm -hmm. So uh, now this, this is something I might tweak a little bit with you guys. So you see the way you have field realms here, that's fine. Yeah. But you see this uh, Eightfold Path, uh, the origins of the path? Yeah. I would maybe try and turn that so that it just had like the volume one down here and maybe the Eightfold Path symbol on there just to keep that a little cleaner. Oh, that would be that's, quite cool. That's, that's, sorry, my design brain's kicking in here. <laughs> um, and all of these are very early. They're, they're still in pre-production. Yeah. So if you have any ideas yourselves at home, definitely oh, yeah. get, get on to us about it. No, um, it's, it's a nice idea having that. It's a, it's a nice flavour touch because that's, yeah. that's the real thing with this game. There's so much flavour to it. Well, the idea is the point of sale stand when it does go out to retail will be a bookshelf. Yeah, uh, a card bookshelf. So you'll come across it and there will be in it the volumes of the Fabled Realms. Mm -hmm. So you'll have... The Eightfold Path in this kind of creamy colour with their symbol on it. Mm -hmm. You'll have the Dragoy in a purpley colour. Mm. So you'll still be able to easily t tell, tell which who. one's yeah. which. But you, you should look like, uh, the idea is it looks like the inside of the Nunsuch University where they've got, and each of the expansions will be their own volume. So mm. this is the origins of the path because it's the starter set for the Eightfold Path. Yeah. But um, the next one will, for example, be uh, Path. Wardens, mm -hmm. who are a group of henchmen that have the cleanser, yeah. which you, you'll see in some of the other stuff, mm -hmm. and a shield, but and they they protect and look after the the Eightfold Path Shrine, which we've shown off. Oh yes. So uh, that that'll be um, sort of wardens wardens of the wardens of Mother or mm -hmm. something like that will yeah, be the yeah. name of the volume. Okay. So every one will have its own name, mm -hmm. and then hopefully that will make it, it. It's one of those little things that that we thought was quite nice that they're all books. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it's all as if you're getting a new story to read. Yeah. It's actually a new story to play on your tabletop. And you'll have the back, in the front of it, you will have the story of the background of the characters. Mm -hmm. So for each person in the box that has their story, yeah? Yeah. That's a really nice touch. That's, that's clever. I love, I love the flavour of it. Because it's, it's all flavour pieces that you're doing, which mm -hmm. are just adding to the world and making me want it more. I do want this stuff now. Yeah. I'm going to say this, I personally want this stuff for my own collection. You know, I want to have this at home, but I, I think Cad might say no. If I tried to take it home, yeah. that might be frowned upon. Uh, it'll be Ben will be very sad at home because he said, <laughs> you are definitely sending it back, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> but see, that's the thing. Whenever you guys brought this across, it arrived with a ton of stuff. We open it up and it's just like, well, Foreground sent us a, a cast or a, a beaten iron helmet. 
Um, are we sending this back? <laughs> uh, you, and when you guys got here, I was just like, yes, you're sending it back. We, we, we need that. We, yeah. we want this back. <laughs> yeah, they don't feel sad without yeah. it. Yeah, but no, uh, seriously, Cad, thank you for coming in and showing off some of the extra stuff. I'm loving seeing the, the new factions and mm -hmm. stuff a little bit early because there, there's sometimes whenever you don't get to see that, that early work in progress stuff to actually mm -hmm. see where the design ideas are coming from and going to. Yeah, and it's all, all part of uh, one of the reasons why we're doing the Kickstarter is to share the story of, mm -hmm. of how we're getting from A to B yeah. and, uh, and have everybody involved in it. Mm -hmm. So it, we, we don't want to start the story halfway through. Might as well start at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Well, Cad, thank you very much for coming in today. Uh, guys, okay. we will move on here. Get your comments in. Are you looking forward to seeing what's happening with the Fabled Realms? Uh, I know I certainly am. Hopefully you are all too. Get those comments in. We'll see you in the next one. Progress comes to a world of magic as science and the arcane combine to make marvels. Meet steampunk inventors and orc mystics at the Volsun Hub on beastsofwar.com. Become a general of mighty armies at the Kings of Warhub. Take command of elves, dwarves and orcs in this game of masked fantasy combat on beastsofwar.com. This has me really excited. Yeah. You can guess why. Because it's beautiful miniatures and it's a really cool looking world. It has been cool though. The guys, Ben, the guys have been playing it. Yeah. yeah. We have a bunch yeah. of demo games and stuff now in the can yeah. that we're going to release over the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I've got to say, it's just, uh, well, well, there it's... has been a lot of fun taking place in here. Yeah. Yeah. We see that, that's the thing. It's, it's learning that new game, but learning that, that new way of playing the tactics. Yeah. Because the activation in this is, all right, it's based off a momentum system, right? So you'll have a certain amount you can do in a turn, but your opponent can react to you in a very fluid manner. Yeah. Also, your units can join and separate in a very fluid manner. So mm -hmm. it actually feels like real mm. combat yeah. without being really heavy and cumbersome. Mm -hmm. so very cool. I, people are going to have to wait to see the demo games, but I have fallen in love with this one. Yeah. Absolutely fallen it, in love it's, with this one. It, it has been fascinating watching this uh, watching this game come together so mm -hmm. um stay tuned and we will be we will be bringing you uh, demo games just as soon as we possibly can mm -hmm. right ben what is yeah. going on in the world man yes yeah, so uh, we're going to kick things off with a little bit of uh, stuff from weird uh, and um sort of the future of malifaux as we're looking towards june and the summer and things like that yeah so um one of the big things they've been looking at is adding a couple more character boxes and, oh, and nice. creatures and stuff to the world mm -hmm. and this starts off uh, with the bandidos that you see there which are very cool indeed yeah always nice to see some good gunfighters and stuff um drawing on that sort of uh, that Wild West element that everybody loves about Malifaux. And then obviously you've got some really cool female characters going on here as well, which yeah. is great mm -hmm. to see. Yeah. Which has uh, always been a strong point of Malifaux, actually. You know, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's always had strong female characters. Yeah. I, I really like the, the, the design choices that they're making with these flowing coats and mm. things like that. See, that's something it just Malifaux, looks so dynamic, doesn't it? It's something Malifaux has done really well since day dot, whenever they started doing their hard plastics and stuff, they really captured a sense of motion in the yeah. miniatures that I really like. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's definitely something that you can see brought across, uh, especially in uh, the second character that you see there, which is Carlos Vasquez. I mean, obviously you're not going to see the, the cloaks and things there, but it's the way that they've done the fire, so that it actually feels like it's got that little bit of motion to it and stuff when you, you know, you're painting it up. Yeah. So it'd be fantastic to see what this looks like with you know, some good object source lighting as well, which is great. Oh, um, but yeah, these yeah. guys just do absolutely amazing stuff when it comes to plastics at the moment. It's that, it's so, that dynamism, yeah. that sense of motion is just really, really good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this um, it also carries on into some of the other stuff as well. So you've got the gremlins have got their really cool iron skeeters. So anybody that's really worried about you know all the plastics and stuff in Malifaux, these guys are going to be you're going to have to be very very careful with these because yeah. they like they're going to be incredibly delicate, but they do look very very cool indeed. And uh, then we kick off the well, we finish off obviously with the uh, the Yasunori as well, which is a fantastic sort of um, Far Eastern inspired character, oh, which looks absolutely fantastic. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this also brings me on to some of the stuff that's actually quite new uh, from the world of um, Weird and Malifaux. Is they're actually going to be working on some proper sculpted bases as well that are uh -huh. going to be in plastic. Nice. So, uh, yeah, they've got some really cool stuff that's been done in the sort of um, area of, um, of ruins. There's also going to be a sewer set. They're also going to be expanding this as well with a graveyard set as well. Yeah. And they're all going to be done in a series of different scales. So you'll have them all the way from like, like their 30 mil all the way up to sort of 50 mil as well. So they'll be useful for all of your big creatures, your characters mm. and things like that. Just to sort of add a little bit more sort of narrative to the world, which is great. And maybe even these could transfer into what we see um, happening um, with the other side as well in the future. Yeah. So maybe we'll see some sculpted bases for that too, which would be good. Yeah, so, yeah. absolutely. absolutely. See, I, I do love that whenever a company brings out stuff specifically designed for the world and it just adds flavor to your mm. miniature when it's on the base 
Really yeah. good idea. Well, you know, there's lots of ways you can make bases now, mm -hmm. but it, it, but whenever you have the actual creators of the narrative themselves, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, you have the, the, stuff, the artwork and stuff behind them, the world yeah. really built into the head, yeah. Lovely stuff. Uh, next up, uh, we, uh, we, we're going to have more campaigns that we're going to be talking about here. Uh, we have the yeah. Operation Sea Lion campaign. Yeah, so this is a new book that's coming out from uh, Warlord Games for all you people that are big fans of Bolt Action. Oh, this yeah. is obviously Operation Sea Lion, which Ariskany has actually talked about before in a, mm -hmm. a, a very good and in-depth uh, article series, which we'll link below and stuff uh, in yeah. the show notes and things. But this is uh, their take on it. You get uh, a really cool um, version of Winston Churchill with his Tommy gun at the ready uh, mm -hmm. as sort of like the promo miniature for this one, which is pretty cool. But this also meant that they were going to be looking to add a little bit more to their miniatures range as well. Mm. So... Obviously, this is all of a little bit of a, a speculative era, a sort of yeah. era of history that never really came to fruition. But if it had done, these are the kind of things you would have seen. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, you've got the Great Panjandrum, which is the crazy thing that you might have seen in some of the sort of old war footage of these going up the beaches and stuff. Yeah, and going out of control. Mm -hmm. And going out of control, exactly, yeah. And then there's also some of the really interesting um, sort of weapons that were built for the Home Guard and stuff. And that's things like the uh, the Home Guard Smith gun that you see and the Northover projector. Actually, in interestingly, the Northover projector was one of the um, the last black powder weapons that was ever issued. Right. to people during the Second World War and in, in history itself. So this actually was like a proper old fashioned, almost like a cannon, really, mm -hmm. which is pretty interesting. Um, obviously, uh, the Home Guard uh, picked up a lot of stuff that was sort of um, used by civilians and things. So you've got the Mark III armadillo there, which was a truck that was turned into a bit of a moving gun platform and things. Yeah. And obviously, you've got some of the early versions of the Home Guard, too. So these they were known as the uh, British LDV. And uh, these were the land defense volunteers and stuff. And you see the there with like the young men and the older men with their shotguns and Molotovs and all kinds of different things. Yeah. One guy's rocking around with the blunderbuss. Yeah, one guy is rocking around with the blunderbuss. I yeah, love that. I like cool. the sledgehammer, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, very very cool. Indeed, what I don't see there though is a bathtub turned over with a hole in it. No, uh, so let's, <laughs> you missed a trick there, Warlord. We could have got that <laughs> bathtub. It's probably in their dad's army range. Oh, it, sure, it, to be fair. Uh, just a little point, actually, on the 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 land, def uh, the local defence volunteers. Sorry, that's that was their name. Not to not to get com uh, confused, but um, they are actually sort of affectionately known as the Look Duck and Vanish Brigade, actually, by a lot of the people in in Britain at the time. Which is why they got sort of renamed to the Home Guard because it sounded a little bit more official, yeah. and people couldn't take the Mickey out of it as so much. But yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah very. I, I think um, we also had some uh, female agents or well, something. There's, there's one more thing first here. Warren. Oh, is there one more thing? <gasps> oh, the original ghillie suits. Yeah, oh, so I some, love some of the snipers for the home guard and things that would have been dressed up in their, their ghillie suits and things, yeah. Zoom in a yeah. bit there, do we see? Oh, yes. Oh, very nice. Oh, I love these. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's one of those things. People never assume that this is where you would have got a ghillie suit during World War II. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, as you say, it leads on to uh, another story that came out sort of uh, earlier in the week, which was to do with... Um, Warlord and Bolt Action, is they're actually going to be adding a lot more female characters to their range, because obviously, you know, there are a lot of them out there as secret agents and all kinds of things like that, and that's what these are here. So you've got a couple of um, agents that you can pick up. Maybe they are fighting over in France in sort of part of the resistance, or maybe they're working in Germany and things. Mm. But um, anyway, Warlord are actually looking for some names for these characters, and at this point as well, uh, even on uh, this weekend, they're also still looking for names over on the Facebook page. So if you want to go over there and follow the links and things, you can sort of put your own suggestions in to what you want to call them. Maybe Agent Card it might be a good name. Yeah. You know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I'm sorry, th those, those ladies look more British. Well, yeah, maybe, but yeah, there you go. Yeah. So maybe they're a bit of Americans in there maybe, as well. But, maybe. Uh, yeah. But um, yes. Uh, also, if you do actually get your comments in and sort of uh, put the names forward for these, you could actually wear, uh, win a pair of them. So if mm. you're interested in picking up some of these miniatures, maybe that would be a good avenue to do so. Fantastic. Cool. Fantastic. Cool. Okay. Uh, next up, a beta test. Mm -hmm. from the guys over at War Cradle. So Wild West Exodus is now, uh, its second edition is now in public beta. Mm -hmm. Ben, what can yeah. you tell us about it? Yeah, so um, the public uh, beta, as you say, is up for people to download. Um, they've included all of the PDF rules for you to get. So you've got the main core rules as well as a whole bunch of the stuff to do with the individual factions. Lots of things to do with um, card corrections and all kinds of things like that. So if you're interested in working out um, a, a little bit of a how the second edition works, this is a good way to get involved. Yeah. This also means that you can feed back into the program and help sort of help out War Cradle with this. Let them know what's working, what's not. They're really interested in finding out sort of you know what you like, what you don't like. So they can sort of make it the best edition of the game that you you know that you, you can get on the tabletop, which mm -hmm. is good. Mm -hmm. um, this also 
sort of leads into some new models as well that have been teased by uh, War Cradle. And the That's first one of these work. was actually a uh, legendary Marie Leveau, which is very cool indeed. Um, now, you might recognize her in her form as the um, the lady with the snake that we actually talked about uh, a long time ago on one of the weekenders. Yeah. But she's now taken on a little bit more of an Ursula role from sort of uh, Little Mermaid in a slightly creepier oh. vein, I guess you'd say. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Dude, Tara. yeah. Some serious horror. <laughs> Uh-huh. And then I think this is her original form. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so what, what, at... what has happened? Has she evolved into that? Or, or what's... Uh... Uh, the idea is that she's sort of uh, taken a lot more of the, the power and stuff from uh, the materials and things she's using, and it's sort of transformed her in slightly darker ways than I imagine she probably wanted it to. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but um, they're obviously going to be expanding on the fluff and the universe and taking it forward as a narrative as well uh, when it comes to the second edition. Like... So it'll be interesting to find where that goes. She looks like... Yeah. I'm not saying what she looks like. I'm, I'm going to get myself into trouble. <laughs> I'm gonna, mm. For the first time ever, you, you I have... managed to catch it before I put my foot in my mouth. Here's the, th here's the way to put it. Uh, the guys Careful, at War Cradle man. have decided to create a horrifying miniature. Good job. Excellent work, War Cradle. <laughs> um, as well as that, they're also going to be looking back at um, re-sculpting a, a selection of the range as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the next things we bring up actually shows off what they're going to be doing for the Wayward 8. Oh, um, yes. Which were obviously inspired by yes. the Firefly crew and things yeah. like that. So, um, yeah, they've, they've done a new Justin? update uh, for these can... with all the yeah. new characters and uh -huh. stuff. So. Yeah. Oh, very nice. Yeah, cool. These sculpts are great. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, we've actually invited the, the War Cradle guys to come over next week. Mm -hmm. um, so um, on Monday, um, we're hoping they're going to be here. We're going to try and get a, a bit of beta, beta testing on camera as well. We're going to try and get a, a, get a couple of games filmed. Yep. But uh, as well as that, I'm going to get I'm going to get them on the uh, on the show to yeah. talk about um, what the plans are, where they've been, how the game is changing because the game's getting a, a bit bigger actually. Yeah. So it's um, there's a lot of very interesting stuff taking place mm -hmm. there. Well, I mean, like, I did get a chance to chat with the guys at War Cradle at Salute this year, and mm -hmm. they, they, they did up a beautiful stand. And they actually they hired one of the, the great cosplayers in the industry, uh, Tabitha Lyons, to do one of the characters, the free character they were giving away, mm -hmm. Salute, I believe it was. But uh, it's really nice to see this game coming back into the spotlight a bit more, because yeah. anybody who has watched the Wild West Exodus week that we did knows that it has a special place in my heart. And yeah, I, it does. Yeah. I want to play a little bit more. Uh, well, it will now. Apparently, the the, the game is is growing in size, mm -hmm. and uh, there's I'm, I'm, I'm there's looking forward to a number of changes. Some subtle, some not so subtle. Mm. But yeah, we will find out more about that next week when we when we get the guys on the on the show. Mm -hmm. Right, another campaign. Um, <laughs> yep. This one is the the Kings of War summer campaign. Um, it'll be uh, launching a bit later in the year. Again, this one will be coming to you via War Console, so we're going to be working on this one as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just as soon as we um, get Strike Zone um, out the door, mm -hmm. um, uh, work is going to be uh, focused in on the Edge of the Abyss, or what mm -hmm. our online version of it is going to be. Mm -hmm. Ben, what can you tell us about it? Because it's also a book, I believe. Yeah, so they're going to bring up, uh, bring it out a campaign book that will all be surrounded around this uh, this uh, idea of the edge of the abyss. Now, this is a, a rift, effectively, in the world of Mantica, mm -hmm. and both the the evil forces and the good forces are all struggling to control it and contain it and things like that. And so, this will be a way for you to not only play games in the world of Mantica and enjoy Kings of War over the summer, but also to potentially influence the world as well going forward, which is a big thing that Mantica have always been interested in, especially after what we saw with the the the, um, the last Kickstarter, which was all to do with Kings of War, which is good. Mm -hmm. um, um, one of the big things that's going to be coming as part of the book itself is there's going to be a whole bunch of optional rules included in there. Mm -hmm. Now, they've told us a little bit about uh, some of these already. For example, one of the uh, optional rules they're going to be looking at is the use of formations. Yeah. And so this is a way for you to build up armies that are themed in a specific way uh, that will give you certain benefits and things like that. They're also going to be adding in a whole bunch of new units as well. And there's also going to be a smattering of uh, other special rules too. Um, now, they have stressed that you don't have to use any of these special rules, but they're all themed and they're all sort of narratively driven to sort of encourage the campaign and the storyline to progress on the tabletop and tell a little bit of a story when you're playing it with your mates at home or in clubs and things like that, which is pretty yeah. cool. 
Um, this also brings into play a whole bunch of new characters as well that are going to be sort of be the key focus of this campaign going forward. Yeah. And uh, we have some of the artwork here and some of the background that uh, Mantic were kind enough to sort of give to us, which is really, really cool. Oh, very nice. Um, yeah. Yeah. We're really, I'm really, really liking the new sort of art direction they've gone with a lot of these characters. It looks absolutely fantastic. And it's got mm-hmm. that sort of nice, clean comic book feel to it, which is yeah. really good. Mm-hmm. It was something that we saw a lot when it came towards the sort of end period of what we're, what we're looking at with the Kickstarter we mentioned before for Kings of War. And it's just really yeah. nice to see the new races getting involved and getting a sort of an extra boost and stuff mm-hmm. one of the characters that i really liked in particular was i think it's jarvis who is the sort of um sorcerer fellow he's actually uh, a necromancer that um works for well he, he plays for the undead and he can raise zombies and skeletons and all kind of things but he's actually um a hero of good Mm-hmm. And he only brings back the good souls that he believes will fight for just and reason and stuff. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be interesting to see how his his character sort of evolves over the period of this campaign and whether or not he will fall to darkness and things like that. And hopefully, of course, we'll see some really cool miniatures for these two, which would be good. So, I've yeah. got to agree with you on the art direction on this. The, mm-hmm. the art direction it's is very cool, isn't it? brilliant on this. I this has really to be my like one, this. the Demon yeah. Hunter. I like mm-hmm. that one as well, Justin, I've got to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's actually for one of the races that a lot of people really like, uh, sort of like in the background of Mantica, because they're the uh, the guys that are sort of um, a bit more Vikingy and stuff like that. And people mm-hmm. have been picking up a lot of their stuff to do with Saga and all the things from Griffin Beast and sort of making them into Kings of War armies on the tabletop for the Kingdoms of Men. And so this is one of the characters that sort of really brings that world to life and gives it a little bit more of a sort of concrete look yeah. and feel mm-hmm. to how this sort of would would be on the tabletop, which is cool. Yeah, so. fantastic. Well, uh, that is your lot on the news. Um, tomorrow, um, we have on the, the backstage version of the show, mm-hmm. um, we have the foreground guys, and again, we're going to be looking at this magnificent <laughs> fort. Oh, it's not just the magnificent fort. We have a little prize tomorrow, but you'll have to watch tomorrow's show to find out what it is. We're giving away the fort, guys! <laughs> so if you're a backstager and you want to be in with a chance of winning that, come across mm-hmm. uh, tomorrow, Sunday. Um, and yeah, but post post a comment and watch that because it's um, it just I've been drooling. Ah, look at it, it's awesome. Right, uh, we're going to take a quick break because after the break, yeah. um, we are going to sit down with um, Jim Oriskany, who has mm-hmm. a brand new article series about the Battle of Midway. Yes. Now we're coming up, or we are on there thereabouts, the anniversary, I believe, coming the, close to the seventy fifth anniversary. Yeah. So this was huge. Naval battle that that really changed the dynamic, or at least proved the change of dynamics um, of uh, naval warfare. But mm. I'm not going to gush about it because we have our resident expert to talk about it, and it is fascinating. We'll be right back after this. Greek mythology rages to life in mythic battles pantheon. Become a god and command heroes and monsters in a battle for Olympus at beastsofwar.com. Take control of armies from the five kingdoms of Arcania and vie for the throne of the ancient king in Wrath of Kings. Master your skills on the battlefield over on beastofwar.com. Hi everybody, we have been joined by James the Historical Editor once again. And James, we have something very nice to talk about this time. Mm-hmm. It's the 75th anniversary of the Battle of Midway. So, uh, John, I'm sure you'll have some stuff to kick into this one. Bits and pieces, yeah. yeah Bits yeah. and pieces. So, James, what's the plan here, mate? Well, yeah, like you said, it's the uh, 75th anniversary of the Battle of Midway, so it's time to get our feet wet in some naval action. That, that was that was a terrible pun. I'm sorry, everybody. That was unforgivable. <laughs> oh! um, no, seriously, it's time to get our... Yeah, that was that, that was awful. It's too early in the morning for... Just run with it. Go, go, go. go. It now. You, you, you've dug the hole. You may as well head for China. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me find the bottom of this hole. No, I'm just kidding. All right, so, um, yeah, so it takes place in uh, early June of 1942, uh, it's a pretty huge naval battle fought between uh, the United States um, and the Japanese Empire. Mm-hmm. Um, it really is a, uh, a turning point uh, in, in, in the Pacific War. A lot of times, if you ask me, uh, some may disagree, um, the word turning point gets overused. Mm. A lot of battles that we tend to think of as turning points like Gettysburg or Stalingrad or Waterloo or Second Al Alamein, really aren't turning points, if, if you look at the details. The, the war had turned long, long before then, and they're part of a much broader scope of events that and interconnective uh, decisions and, and battles that eventually turned uh, a given war around. Mm-hmm. But in in Midway, you really have uh, 
a turning point. History doesn't usually turn 180 degrees in a snap. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, this really might have been one of those times, or at least as close to a genuine turning point as, as, as we're likely to see. Yeah. Well, you see, here, here's the thing. The, the Battle of Midway is always an interesting one for me because it's such a different style of warfare to what we've traditionally seen within World War II. Yep. Normally it is a ground battle. You're going to get your troops in and they are just going to steamroller across the ground until they have ground and pound the enemy into submission. Yep. And what, what you find is in the Pacific Theatre, if you didn't have that naval element, the ground combat just couldn't happen. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where the Pacific is highly dependent on the technology that's around mm -hmm. not you know you don't need it so much on the ground forces you know tanks and stuff like that it doesn't matter how good each individual vehicle is yeah but it does matter in the pacific that your naval forces are capable and very strong mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that's that's where i see the pacific theater lying it's more dependent on the naval arm because if it wasn't there it would have been an almost impossible war to fight yeah yeah now uh, james quick question which gaming yeah. system are you going to be running for this series uh, well, my friend um, Hendrik uh, Jan, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, um, he's, uh, his Beast of War title is uh, Ecclesiastes, um, has a game system that he's developed over the years called Naval War. Mm -hmm. uh, that's www.naval-war.com. Um, it's a great system. It's specifically tailored for World War II naval combat. Mm -hmm. um, and it's uh, really pretty detailed, uh, but without counting too many rivets, so to speak. Um, it's also very adaptable. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was written primarily for gunnery duels, like uh, Graf Spey, uh, Surigawa Strait, some of the big uh, cruiser actions in Guadalcanal that we featured um, in an earlier article series. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, when I approached Hendrik, or Hendrik Gann about doing uh, a, um, a midway battle, he was like, well, I, I think we can do it. And when we started to do individual encounters within midway, uh, we found that his, uh, his system worked damn near perfectly. Uh, so please, everybody, if you have any interest in, in naval um, operations or combat in World War II, uh, check out this system. He's got a great site, uh, lots of downloads, rules, uh, examples. He's got some amazing photos in there. That's when I that's how I first uh, got to know him. He posts uh, some of his images of his warships on uh, on Beasts of War. I think we're having and a look at some of them now. He's he through some images. Oh, yeah. Um, there are some images in the uh, in the in the article series. Um, mm -hmm. Those are the images that I sent uh, for, for the interview, mm -hmm. um, and they they really are great. His miniatures, my God, they're one to eighteen hundred scale warships. Because some of these warships are like eight hundred feet long. You can't do that in twenty eight millimeter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we could try. We could, it, we it would could look try. amazing. Yamato in fifty six in one, at one to fifty six would be like uh, that would be amazing, like sixteen I, feet long. But it I would think be that's what they have at the Yamato Museum. It's something yeah, along it's, it's bigger. Is it? It's bigger. It's eighty foot long. Oh right. Yeah. That's that's one to ten. Yeah, it's something <laughs> daft like one to ten insane. in the Yamato Museum. Yeah, yeah. All right. So even at, even at one to eighteen hundred, I mean, you can tell not only the class of his ships, but sometimes the individual ships, and at that scale, that's yeah, that's absolutely amazing. We see the the actual engineering that goes into some ships and stuff, because these things were bloody behemoths back in the day. Yeah. You know. It, you look at Bismarck, you look at uh, Yamato, they were just absolute yep. monsters. Although you do, you do tend to notice that um, the naval ship design depends on where they are in the world. Mm -hmm. And this was something I found out when I was looking into Yamato and stuff, because I was looking at World of Warships and a, mm -hmm. they had a documentary on it. Yeah. And it was the whole, the British Navy did decent sized ships, mm -hmm. but they needed them to have like less crew, they needed to be a bit faster because they had a worldwide empire at mm -hmm. their height. Then the Germans came along and they went, well, we have to build ships that will fit through our canals. Yeah, and the Bismarck barely did. And the, the Bismarck barely did. Then the, the Americans also had the Panama Canal, mm -hmm. so they had yep. to fit ships through that. And then you go to Japan, and Japan was like, well, we have no canals to worry about. Yeah. Our empire is only expanding, so we don't need to be very fast. Yeah. But we do need gunnery, and yeah. we do need big guns. And then that's where the Yamato classes started coming mm -hmm. out. And then you get the big carriers coming as well, and some of these things are utterly vast. Well, I mean, what, Yamato's at 77, 78,000 tons or something like that? Ooh. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the largest, battle, largest class of battleships ever built. Yeah. Uh, this is a ship that, I mean, we talk a lot about the Bismarck and the Tirpitz in the Atlantic. Uh, this was a ship that would have eaten both Bismarck and Tirpitz yep. at once for breakfast. <laughs> this thing was absolutely monstrous. 18-inch mm -hmm. yep. guns. Um, would have sunk almost anything the Americans had at the time. Uh, 
in an actual gunnery battle, but of course we never let it become a gunnery battle. Yeah. And that's, that's that's part of uh, you know what the Pacific is all about. Yeah, you you'll find, and I'm I'm pretty sure you're going to cover it probably in this chat and then definitely in the article series, is that we start to see the battleships aren't as important as people thought they were going to be. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, to get back to the to, to get back to the systems that we're using, mm. um, the problem with battles like Midway uh, in, in any kind of war gaming or a miniature set is you've got some units that are 800 feet long plus the aircraft carriers and, and some of the battleships. Mm -hmm. Some of your units travel at 300 miles per hour. That's of course the aircraft, and your battle area is sometimes five and six hundred miles across. You can't do that in miniature, really. So you literally need like like two maps. You need an operational map, and then you need a tactical map. And I've, like I've said, we, we use Hendrick Young's uh, Naval War System for the tactical action because his 1 to 1800 scale uh, miniatures and rule system, please check out this rule system, is really superb. Yeah. Um, I've done a lot of Naval War gaming over the years, in World War II especially, and... Um, I've almost never found like that sweet spot of, of complexity. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll get back to that in just a little bit of a second. But what you were saying a second ago about how the battleships can never get close, when you actually come up with like an operational scale map, and that's a game that's come out of um, Oriskany's uh, Dining Room Studios, uh, Frankenstein, let me just quick, quick, quickly build a game myself, mm. is, um, yeah, you actually measure everything out. Uh, Hex is 20 nautical miles across. The ships are, uh, they move at such and such a speed. The ranges, there are no ranges because, like I said, the hexes are 20 miles across. Mm -hmm. You have to be in the same hex to engage somebody in, in gunnery combat. Um, and um, there are four-hour turns. And you actually do all this math and you have the game scaled in space and in time and mm -hmm. in speed. And your, car your, your, your carriers have the strike range of the aircraft at the time. And you actually start to play this out and game this out and actually try it. And there's no way a battleship can ever come to blows. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't happen. By the time the battleship gets within one hex of the carrier, that carrier has hit that battleship group 10, 20 times with successive waves of aircraft. Mm -hmm. And unless that battleship has a carrier of its own to defend it from the air, it's just that big of a target. I mean, Yamato went down. Her sister ship, Musashi, went down. All the Japanese battleships almost went down. Uh, the American, the whole American Navy was practically sunk at Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. The British wiped out the Italians at Toronto, and this happens even before the Big Pacific War. Excuse me, before the Big Pacific War gets started. So it's been amply dem. Technically speaking, the Yamato was crippled by aircraft. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the worst aircraft you've ever seen in combat. It was a suicide mission that they sent these guys up in these planes, uh, the swordfish torpedo planes. The things were built of wire and canvas. Uh, they were biplanes from the previous war, practically, and they were still able to slow down the Bismarck enough so that the rest of the battleships could catch up with it and finally yeah. sink her. Aircraft are, are by, by the middle of 19, by the middle of World War II, aircraft are everything, and the battleship is just, it's they're there to protect the carriers, and they're to bombard beachheads before yeah. landing, and yeah. um, you also say they don't build them anymore, and you Yes, we're still building carriers. So mm -hmm. yeah, we see this. This is the thing. I mean, like once the battleship starts to to become that more of a an escort piece, do I, do I really need those sixteen inch guns on there? It's not even that. It's it's too expensive to mm. like if you if you have a carrier group, you're going to want at least four or five escorts mm -hmm. that are big ships that are going to focus on anti air or close support. Yeah, and you don't want to invest twenty, thirty, forty million dollars into something that's going to sit one there. Big lump. And is only going to have ten percent of its gunnery actually useful in a carrier group, mm -hmm. and it's it's just not efficient anymore. Mm -hmm. All, right, All right, so uh, James, can you give us some very quick background on what exactly was happening at Midway? What was the the real goal of the the operations there? Okay, so uh, that's a great question. Uh, to get into it, I have to go back just a little to the beginning of World War II in the Pacific, mm -hmm. uh, which is only like six months previously. Um, so World War II in the Pacific starts in 1941. Uh, notice I do not say World War II in Asia. Uh, that's, that starts in 1937 with um, the Japanese invasion of uh, China. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, they, uh, the Japanese attack the United States at Pearl Harbor in December 7th, a date that was living in for me, we've all seen the movie, uh, at Pearl Harbor, that's December 7th, 1941. Mm -hmm. So without getting into all the reasons as to why the Japanese attacked the United States or whatever, um, they didn't just attack the United States. They had to attack a bunch of other people all at once. Mm -hmm. They were trying to get to str strategic materials down in Southeast Asia. They wanted the oil in the Dutch East Indies. They wanted um, 
rubber in Southeast Asia that's owned by the French at the time. You have the British Navy in Singapore, which was gonna be a problem. Um, there's a lot of bauxite down there that you use to uh, refine aluminum, which you need for aircraft. So they need all these things and they have to get all these enemies out of the way up front. The French and the Dutch at the time were already having big problems with the Germans in Europe. Um, so they weren't gonna be able to put up that much of a defense, but the British were still a factor in Singapore. And of course, the big problem uh, was the Americans who weren't in the war yet, and they had a huge Pacific fleet. Mm -hmm. The Americans also had the Philippines at the time. The Philippines was part of the United States uh, territories at the time. And if you remember, if you quickly like imagine a map, like Japan down to uh, Southeast Asia, the Philippines are right in the way. Yeah. So they have to knock out the American Navy in one shot right off the bat. That's Pearl Harbor. Yeah. The objective of Pearl Harbor was to sink all our battleships and all of our carriers. As fate would have it, our carriers just happened to be out of harbor that day. We lost or severely or lost or sustained severe damage to all eight of our battleships on December 7th, but none of our carriers. Mm -hmm. And we only had three carriers at the time uh, in the Pacific. Yeah. So from there on, the Japanese mission is sink the American aircraft carrier fleet. It's not very big, but it's still a problem. We have to go out and these, and they're kind of puttering around. They, you know, they're obviously they're engaged in multiple other campaigns around the Pacific and in uh, along the Asian coast. So it's not really a priority until the Japanese are the Japanese homeland is in fact bombed by uh, uh, land-based uh, U.S. Army Air Force bombers off of USS Hornet. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, we see that at the end of the the, the, uh, the Pearl Harbor movie, and uh, that's considered uh, by a lot of historians to be a huge problem and a huge reason why the Japanese said, "Okay, we have to refocus on these American carriers; they're really a problem." Mm -hmm. I don't know if I 100% agree with that. The Doolittle raid, uh, named for the guy who did it, uh, James Doolittle, mm -hmm. really did little. <laughs> it was kind of <laughs> uh, well named. Well, wasn't that the one um, where they they were launching them off the carriers? The, yeah. the bombers barely had runway to do it on board the carriers. Yeah. And whenever they actually got to the target, the crews were dropping their bombs and having to bail out. They didn't have the fuel. They were having to home. bail out or they were having to land in China. Because yeah. it, it was an engineering nightmare to get a bomber. They were B-25s, I think. Yeah. To get a B-25 two-engine bomber off the deck of a carrier to land on a carrier. Yeah, forget it. That's not going to happen. <laughs> so, like, we're going to take off from the carrier. We're going to bomb our targets. Then we're going to, you know, hopefully land in China. Yeah. Uh, which again was uh, was definitely an allied country at the time. We were uh, that was kind of half the reason Pearl Harbor happened was what the Japanese army was doing in, in China. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of problems there. We won't get sunk into the atrocities and politics and everything, but it's course, it's a it's a it's a nasty little war. Yeah, yeah. A nasty See, that, that's war, the thing. It's, it's it's the one you never hear about though in the mainstream history. Yeah, it's 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 horrifying. It's mm -hmm. uh, it's something that that's starting to change. A great book came out a couple of years ago about the about the rape of Van King. Mm -hmm. There, there are there. It is starting to come out a little bit, mm. but uh, that's like I was saying. You know, World War II doesn't start in 1939. It starts in 1937. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and there, there's there's little loose threads of international law that can actually back you up on that if you want to get into the weeds on that. Mm -hmm. But um, no, I mean just in general. Uh, but um, okay, where was I? Okay, so we, what really gets the Japanese Navy? back on track about sinking the American carriers is the Battle of the Coral Sea. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is down south near New, uh, down, down near New Guinea. And uh, the Japanese had taken the northern half of New Guinea and they couldn't get across the southern half. This is where we see battles like Kokoda Trail and the, how well the Australians were doing down there. Because mm -hmm. Australia is right, you know, remember, if you look at a map of, of the Pacific, it's New Guinea, right, right after that is, uh, is Australia. Yeah. The Australians are very, very interested in keeping the Japanese out of New Guinea. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, they're next. It's literally their doorstep. Mm -hmm. So the Japanese had a big invasion. They were going to go around the uh, eastern tip of uh, New Guinea and land on the, the back door at a place called Port Moresby. And that's the Battle of the Coral Sea. We had two American carriers there versus two Japanese carriers, uh, Shokaku and Zuokaku, against um, Yorktown and USS Lexington. Um, the Japanese technically win that battle in a tactical sense. They, they lose less ships. Their ships that they lose are much smaller than the Americans. The Americans kind of get beat up again. But they do force the Japanese um, invasion fleet, all their troop ships, to turn around and go back home. And they prevent the invasion of, Fort, of Port Moresby, which prevents the fall of Australia, or at least the invasion of Australia. Mm -hmm, yeah. Long story short, it's the 
first time Japanese planes are actually frustrated. It's almost like the Battle of Britain of the Pacific. Mm-hmm. Um, Germany doesn't actually lose anything, but they, all, they lose a lot of aircraft, obviously. But this is the first time one of, their, one of the Japanese invasions is really stopped. And it's all down to American aircraft carriers. Mm-hmm. So the Japanese say, okay, that's it. Between the Doolittle Raid and especially the Battle of Coral Sea, it is time to sink these American carriers. We've had it. We have to do this now before the Americans just start churning out these these aircraft carriers, which they knew that we were doing already. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, the, 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 chief, the, the chief of the Japanese Navy lived and studied abroad in the United States for almost 10 years, or I don't know how many years, but for a lot, several years mm. before the war. He, he knew the United States, he knew about our factories, knew about our shipyards. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's Izuruku Yamamoto, and he, uh, he warned his people before the war started. He's like, I'll give you six months of victories. After that, all bets are off. The Americans are just going to start building stuff out of hand. Yeah. And uh, this is right about the six-month mark. And <laughs> so he, he called it. Th- this was the thing, though. As, as soon as America turned its industry to actually producing ships, they just had shift after shift of men. The, sh- the ships were just you know, flying together and just yep. rolling out. It was crazy. On, on that note, actually, it would be a good point to, to mention this is where the woman of America really shone. Mm. In the shipyards, in yep. the factories. The women were brought in, mm. they were taught how to weld, they were taught to rivet, mm. and these women put these ships together and they did a superb job oh, yeah, with yeah. the American production yeah. side of things. You, know, you imagine, like, James will know this really well, the Liberty ships, mm. churning out oh, Liberty yeah. ships and making it a competition between shipyards to see how quick you could put one out. Uh. And it was like, it went from 10 days to seven days, and I think, was there one in four? There was, there I was can't a, remember there was how big was this ship, one, and how the hell did they do it in four was, days? But it was, uh, it, these Liberty ships were built by, or were designed by a guy, I think his name was Levitz, mm-hmm. um, and they were designed to be mass produced as if in a factory, which is kind of ironic, it's how we build our aircraft carriers now. And these Liberty ships were just like cargo ships, they were terrible ships, they were meant yeah. to be, uh, you know, cargo ships that leaked all over the place, you know, they were basically torpedo bait, but we needed a lot of them, and we needed them now to help keep England in the war, help keep Australia supplied, Australia in the war, and uh, they were being built in some ridiculous amounts of time, yeah. Yeah. like ships that normally take seven, eight years to build, like big aircraft carriers, like a modern day Nimitz class aircraft carrier, yeah. Yeah. can take seven years to build. They were, they were cranking them out in like a week back in the day. It's insanely small. <laughs> they don't build them like they used to. That's probably a good thing. It probably <laughs> is. Yeah. But I mean, that's, that, that shows you what happens you know, when America really yeah. turned itself to war production yeah. and they got the, the population motivated. Because obviously, they had the big propaganda moves of mm-hmm. look at Pearl Harbor, look yeah. how many of our sailors. Look what was done to us. Look at, look at your husbands and sons and fathers that were killed or wounded yeah. because that affected a lot of American families in oh, the yeah. Pacific region. Yeah, yeah. And then oh, yeah. The, the American government can go, we don't even need to make a big propaganda machine out of this. It's just served itself to us yeah. on a plate. Yeah. And Amer- the American public just went, build stuff. Just yeah. keep going. Yeah. It's time to fight back. <laughs> yeah. That's. That's just insane. I mean, like it's it's one of those things about this this particular theater. There are a few really really special things about it that that were so different from like the yep. war in Europe. Yeah. I mean, like uh, James, do you have any uh, any special pieces for Midway for us? Okay. Uh, so John was mentioning technology earlier and the mm-hmm. the, the, the difference that technology was going to make in in um, in the Pacific. Uh, obviously, John, you're absolutely correct. Um, the Pacific War was. Um, pretty much entirely a war of islands. And uh, you can't win a war on islands if you don't control the ocean around the island. And in the age of the aircraft carrier, you can't control the water around an island if you don't control the air above the island and the surrounding ocean. So aircraft carriers became just about everything. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, nuclear missile submarines are a big deal. They didn't have those back then. But uh, so in World War II, the blue chip of the Navy is the aircraft carrier. And the aircraft carrier is the center of every fleet. If you don't have an aircraft carrier, you really don't have a Navy at all. And every other part of your Navy supports in some way or another your aircraft carrier operations. I bring that up because aircraft carriers are at the time one of the most technologically complex machines we'd ever built. Mm-hmm. Um, if you, uh, For some viewers who may not realize how an aircraft carrier works, you have obviously the flat top, that's your flight deck. Underneath that, you have a hangar deck. So you have basically an entire floating airport driving around, sometimes at 30, 35 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, you have to have these enormous elevator lifts that bring aircraft up and down. You have to carry not only all the ships, fuel and ammunition and supplies, you have to support the uh, ammunition ordinance and fuel, high octane aviation fuel, and this becomes a big problem at Midway. Yeah. Um, uh, for your air group, and some of these some of these carriers at the time were carrying, you know, 80, 90, or 95 aircraft that can range out like 30 or 40 miles. Mm. Um, the Japanese did not have radar on their ships at the time, but the Americans did, and this became another big problem uh, that we'll talk about in the article series. So technology is going to play a really big role. There's no shovel war like you see on the Eastern Front, where it's, you know, who can dig trenches the fastest or who can, you know, lay the most mines. Mm. You have to have these huge moving in the water ships. And it's one thing to build the ship, but then to support to, to build the support fleet that keeps it out there, mm-hmm. is is uh, amazing. Um, some other things that happen is that your 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 plans become very very complex because of this technological element and because of the range over which your operations have to take place. If you look at the Battle of Midway from the Japanese perspective, and you step far back enough, and you look at like Yamamoto's perspective, this is like the four-star admiral's um, perspective of the battle. He's got units in play and in movement, ranging from New Guinea to the Aleutian Islands, just off the coast of Alaska. Mm-hmm. His battle map is 8,000 miles wide. You can't do that in 28 millimeter either. <laughs> um, yeah, really so his plan, as complex as it was, and it was really one of the big problems the Japanese were going to face, was to create a situation by which the American carriers had to respond under very unfavorable circumstances. Sometimes we talk about it on Beasts of War, and it's, we want to force the opponent into a dilemma between two equally bad choices. Mm-hmm. So he was going to invade way up in Alaska, or the islands off of Alaska, and also went strike at Midway, which is a small uh, pair of islands, I think, right in the middle of the Pacific, hence Midway. Um, very imaginatively named, I know. Uh, it's actually the very, very tip of the, um, of the Hawaiian island chain. And uh, this is what part of what made it so so crucial to the Americans to defend is we needed to have, or if the Japanese had taken Midway Island, they would actually have a foothold right next to the Hawaiian Islands. Mm-hmm. So Pearl Harbor, that's the stepping stone to Honolulu, uh, the Hawaiian Islands, and then who knows, maybe the west coast of the United States. That's kind of absurd, but it's definitely not a place we can afford to give up. Let's just say that. You see, this, um, this is the thing as well, is having the Hawaiian Islands out there in the ocean it is an excellent staging point further away from your main coastline. It's giving you that, that sort of a, we can stop, we can take a break, we can get ourselves together, we can refuel here, it also, and then go on. It also acts as an early warning system as well. Mm-hmm. So stuff's coming, although they didn't notice that on December 7th. Yeah. But it was there, and if they'd been, yeah. if they'd been more aware of, a th- of the incoming threat, mm-hmm. there, there was a chance that Pearl Harbor couldn't have been as bad as it was. Mm-hmm. Um, they could have had the air fleets up, and, you know, but that's just how it behaves. Yeah, yeah, of course. War plays out in weird ways. Mm. <laughs> um, well, I wonder if the When you're, when you, when you're dealing with, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no after you, James. Um, when, when you're dealing with uh, like naval warfare, there's naval warfare in like the Battle of Norway you know, over in Europe, and then there's like you know what would have happened in the English Channel during Operation Sea Line. If you you know obviously in these kinds of situations, you've got naval units uh, moving around in actually pretty close areas to uh to main major land masses so okay it's naval um but it's 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 very close to a coast out in the pacific there are no coasts mm-hmm. man i mean it, <laughs> there's the ocean that just goes on for literally for weeks mm-hmm. um so the they're holding these tiny little islands they're like these little hooks that you can hang on you know you can draw a line between you connect the dots okay this is the part of the ocean you control because mm-hmm. the last thing that ever happens and we see this even in science fiction uh, space games, which are really just updated naval games, um, is you don't fight these naval battles out in the middle of the ocean, like for no reason. And you're fought over these islands, and the reason you fought over these islands is because you have to have a base mm-hmm. from which you can stage further naval operations, even further into the enemy uh, into enemy territory. And after Midway and Guadalcanal, and you have the Americans, that's when you really see it happening. You see the Americans kind of literally step marching their way back into the Japanese Empire, mm-hmm. um, island by island. And of course, they would skip the first 10 that they don't need. We need that one for certain reasons. Okay, grab that one. The next 20 we don't really need. We need that number 21. Mm-hmm. And that was island hopping. They would literally just hop from one island to the next. Um, naval operations, Marine Corps operations to actually put troops on the ground, take those islands, build an airfield. That's the Seabees, uh, naval engineers. Mm-hmm. 
and they would uh, build these enormous airstrips. It's one of these airstrips that eventually launches the atomic bomb missions right. against Japan that ends the war. You needed to, ha- and people say the atomic bomb ended World War II. Well, it may have ended it, but that atomic bomb never would have been dropped if those islands hadn't been captured after a major carrier battle. It's all about the carriers. Yep. And uh, as far as things about Midway, uh, that weren't maybe strictly naval operations. The Americans also had excellent intelligence. The Americans have broken the Japanese codes. That's the purple code. That's JN-25. You get a situation almost like we saw with Ultra and Enigma over with the British and the Germans in Europe. Mm-hmm. We're reading their mail faster than they are. And um, so the Japanese had this big complex plan involving something like 200 ships across 8,000 miles of ocean to lure us into a trap, we were reading every page of their plan. Mm -hmm. And we're like, oh, well, Japanese are gonna try and catch us in the trap, huh? Okay, well, we're gonna put them in a counter ambush and we're gonna turn the trap back on them. Mm -hmm. And this is part of what helps counter set that enormous, and that's probably the last thing that we're gonna talk about as far as specialties of uh, of Midway. This is the enormous quantitative advantage that the Japanese had. Mm -hmm. 11 carriers to three, depending on how you count them. Really? 10 or 12 battleships to zero, great yeah. big goose egg. Our battleship fleet is still sunk on the, uh, is still sunk on the bottom of Pearl Harbor. Uh, mm-hmm. Cruisers, they outnumber us two to one. Destroyers, tw- you know, 10 to one. Mm-hmm. Submarines, five to one. I can't remember all the numbers, but they really, really outnumber us. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, one of the big ways we were able to counteract that was, you know, it helps if you have the enemy's battle plan, like right there in your hands, and yeah, he you doesn't know you have it. And choose what that's gonna fighting. be a, that's gonna be a big equalizer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, well, uh, last thing then, James. Uh, what kind of things are we planning to see for the, the actual games of Midway, for the war game itself? What sort of mechanics and stuff are you hoping to throw in and show on the tabletop there? Okay, well, um, a bunch of things. Uh, number one, uh, like we were saying earlier, we're going to have hidden movement. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sorry, that's not what I meant. We're going to have two, uh, two levels of maps. Mm-hmm. And on that higher operation map is what I meant to say. We're going to have the hidden movement. Mm-hmm. Um, when you read about the, uh, the Battle of Midway, the first two days of the Battle of Midway are the two fleets trying to find each other. Mm-hmm. Um, again, this is a battle area covering about a quarter million square miles of empty ocean. Mm-hmm. So uh, before satellite imagery or anything of that, you know, kind of stuff, no, no GPS, no cell phones. Um, so that becomes obviously one of the big things to look at right off the bat. Uh, search planes. Um, again, the Japanese have these tiny float planes that they're launching off of their cruisers and battleships. They would also launch some uh, dive bombers off of their, or I think they were dive bombers. Dive bombers were torpedo bombers off of their, some of their carriers mm-hmm. as scout planes. The Americans did have one huge advantage was the island of Midway itself, mm-hmm. which was pretty much almost, you could almost consider it a fourth aircraft carrier that couldn't be sunk. Mm-hmm. And from this base, they were able to launch these PBY Catalinas. Anyone familiar with the Battle of the Atlantic is going to know about these Catalinas. They helped really defeat the U-boats. And they just have range. I mean, this is before aerial refueling. They could fly out 700 miles, do a, do a do like a spoke leg, and then come back 700 miles more. By the time they were done, they would fly almost 2,000 miles. Mm-hmm. And they would search that entire triangle of ocean. And you set up like three or four of these planes, you can cover a lot of ocean uh, relatively quickly. And that's how the Japanese were able to, or how the Americans were able to detect the Japanese um, before vice versa. Um, once we get down into uh, Hendrik Jan's uh, naval war scale, uh, we come across a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, the desperation of some of these attacks is insane. The incredible decisions that had to be made. Uh, things go terribly wrong for both sides. Uh, we see things like the American torpedo bomber attack. Um, it's almost depressing to read. Uh, it's these desperate, hopeless, suicidal, uh, yet incredibly courageous um, torpedo bombing runs on the Japanese fleet in these ancient aircraft that are way too old. Mm-hmm. It's just the best they had at the time. And, uh, you know, but what that does, um, they, they all get shot down. They almost all die. There was like one survivor from all those squadrons. Those planes had more than one guy in them, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, but then what that would also lead to, I don't want to give too much away, but when those dive bombers go in and they, they miss everything and they all are just absolutely massacred, they drag all the uh, Japanese fighters down to the water level at very low altitude. That's how you have to launch a torpedo off of an aircraft. And that just opens up the, the high level altitude to the dive bombers who just by blind luck pretty much happen to find the Japanese 
carriers at that moment and the incredible swings of fortune that go back and forth. The Americans are, despite all their intelligence and all of their planning, they are absolutely losing the Battle of Midway up until about five minutes before the uh, the big dive bomber strike on the American, on the Japanese carrier fleet. Mm-hmm. And the Pacific War turns in some ways in literally five minutes. Um, we see the, 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 uh, the Japanese Navy basically die in place. Uh, you can't write this stuff. You, you can't make it up. George Lucas tried it in the Star Wars series. He failed miserably, if you ask me. But if you watch, <laughs> if you look at, if you look at some of these uh, aircraft battles, and you're like, oh my god, this is totally the the torpedo run at Yavin. You know, stay on target, stay, and they all just get get knocked down. The Y wings, they get knocked down. They get knocked down. They get knocked down. They all die. None of their torpedoes even come close. But uh, what do they do? They open up the they open up the door for the X wings, and mm. that's like, wow, this almost sounds like the Battle of Midway in some mm. ways. Um, so it's an interesting side angle when you, when you read up on some of this stuff, you see where a lot of sci-fi comes from. A lot of the Star Wars battles have their roots in these big Pacific carrier battles. Uh, Battlestar Galactica, the same kind of thing. Archipelagos of islands are transformed into solar systems full of planets and moons. Mm-hmm. And carrier groups are converging and launching, uh, you know, fighter strikes against each other. Mm-hmm. Um, it really, some t- in some ways it comes back to a lot of these old Pacific carrier battles. Yeah, you see, history can be stranger than fiction a lot of the time. You know, some of the stories I've heard come out for over here are crazy. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, very last thing then, James. Uh, how many parts is this series going to be in, and what are you going to cover in each part? Okay, so it's going to be five a five part article series. Mm-hmm. Um, part one is going to take a very quick background of the Pacific War, uh, introduce the Battle of Midway, mm-hmm. just so we have some context. We can show how important the Battle of Midway actually was. Um, and what would have happened if the Americans had lost, which really could have happened. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of factors that uh, we also look at in part one, a lot, at a lot of the different factors that made the battle turn out the way it did. Mm-hmm. These are factors that you're going to need in a midway game. Like I mentioned before, you need two levels of maps. Mm-hmm. Um, you're going to need some sort of hidden movement system, at least on the bigger map. And then once you get down into the tactical battles, you're going to have to look at how aircraft, like a lot of naval games are ships shooting at each other. That never happens at Midway. Mm-hmm. The ships never see each other. It's all aircraft. You have to look at a way, and this is where, again, Hendrigan's system really works out well. Mm-hmm. Even though it's something it wasn't originally designed for, that's how adaptable it is. It really is a great game. Mm-hmm. Um, you need some sort of an aircraft system, uh, an aircraft damage system for when the aircraft start landing hits. And that's where you have another uh, thing you have to look out for is uh, damage control and how the Japanese ships were set up versus how the American battle sh- uh, aircraft carriers were set up. goes back to the technology stuff that John was talking about. Mm-hmm. All this stuff gets kind of looked at quickly in, in part one. Okay. Um, part two goes over some of the uh, Japanese planning, uh, the initial approaches, uh, and uh, the first uh, blows, again, all in war gaming. Uh, Hendrigan uh, recreated all these battles uh, on his tabletop and uh, sent me the results, sent me the photos, sent me the rules. Um, on how this stuff plays out on his tabletop in his system. Um, part three uh, looks at the apex of the battle, where the, where the tide really turns. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, if you know how the Battle of Midway goes, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and so, you know, again, 75th anniversary, it's kind of too late for spoilers. Uh, <laughs> part, well then. Part four. Yeah, if, if you don't know how the Battle of Midway turned out, uh, then you're probably, you know, not watching this part of the show, but that's wasn't, okay. Wasn't there a... There, there was obviously a, an old, almost wartime movie. I think it had. Mm-hmm. Did it have John Wayne in it yep. or something like that? Uh, I actually just watched this movie again yeah. uh, as part of this uh, project. It's got uh, Henry Fonda, Charlton Heston. That's 1977 Midway. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not bad. Of course, old war movies get like a thousand things wrong. You know? <laughs> yeah, they, they have to cut a lot of corners just to make it fit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's not too bad. It uses a lot of stock footage. Yeah, but uh, it's not bad. You can get away with um, that. <laughs> yeah, especially back in the seventies. Mm-hmm. Um, part four covers the counter strike. Uh, the Japanese took a tremendous amount of damage in part three, mm-hmm. um, but they're still able to. Uh, they have one carrier left, and they're able to do some really serious damage back on the Americans. We handle that in part four, along with uh, you know the Americans kind of wrapping things up and hitting that last Japanese carrier. Mm-hmm. Part five sees the parting blows. How the two fleets disengage. Uh, the importance of Midway is hit again, and uh, we start looking at what ifs. Ooh. Um, there were several things that really could have gone differently at Midway. Mm. See, this really is... could have gone differently, and uh, what it would have meant if the Americans had lost, and the Japanese wind up with a base that close to Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Pearl Harbor almost becomes unusable. Now the American Pacific Fleet is based out of San Francisco, and mm. that's a whole different war. 
Yeah, that's that's a whole different supply chain. That's a, a, a knockout punch, mm -hmm. really. Just, mm -hmm. just about, yeah. Yeah, yeah at which Plus, point the Japanese don't have to worry. we lost our three carriers. That's USS Yorktown, mm -hmm. uh, USS Hornet, which, again, was already famous because of its uh, role in the Doolittle Raid, mm -hmm. and USS Enterprise. <laughs> no, we're not talking about Captain Kirk's ship. This is the real USS Enterprise. The original. Most decorated, most decorated warship probably in the history of warfare. Yeah. Um, HMS Victory is probably the only ship that comes close mm. to the amount of laurels and, and destruction that the ship sco scored against its enemies. Mm. Almost 1,000 aircraft, over 300 sh or almost 300 warships sunk by her air group. Mm. She won 20 battle stars. She was the only carrier we had at the beginning and the end of the war. Mm -hmm. She was uh, an absolute legend. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, she's one of the big ships that really does well at the Battle of Midway. Mm. Well, James, thank you very much, mate. I'm sure everyone out there is looking forward to the series. Uh, it's always nice to learn about different types of warfare, especially yep. like this, where it's such a different flavor of it. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, John, thank you for drop dropping in. James, thank you for dropping in. Everybody, thank you for watching. We'll move on and we'll Check see you Check out that so. website, naval-war at... Uh, www.naval-war.com <laughs> Alright, well, guys, uh, we will see you a bit later. Fight for the Iron Kingdoms as a warcaster. Take control of the mighty jacks, arcane devices, and dark sorceries to bring the fight to the War Machine Hub on beastsofwar.com The new Flames of War 4th Edition brings you the battles of World War II in epic 15mm scale. Go to beastsofwar.com to get the latest in news, tactics, and tutorials. That was the moment when carriers became God. Pretty much. That's whenever you had Yamato going down and oh, Musashi took it as Isn't well. it interesting, though, that the, the, way that, um, the, the way that war kind of changes everything? It's, but then the next war technology. changes everything again. Yeah, but it, it's the main driving force for the advancement of technology. Yeah. You know, Which is such look, a pity, but it is what at, it is, uh, isn't it? Look at Windscale here in the UK. That yeah. was our first nuclear power plant. That uh, wasn't to give our own power. That was so that the British could have a nuclear bomb. Yeah. Right. Time for some Kickstarters. So we've got a couple of Kickstarters this week. Ben, we're kicking off with uh, Turf War Z. Yeah, so uh, this is a, uh, a campaign by uh, Studio Miniatures who are going to be working, well, who are working on this really cool 28mm um, uh, skirmish game that is sort of set around like the streets of LA and things like that, but it's got a little bit of a twist to it, as you might have guessed by the inclusion of the, of the letter Z, yeah. uh, but this is adding a little bit of a zombie apocalypse feel to this as well. So the, the, way that, the way this has been described to me, Ben, is it's kind of like the, the GTA on the tabletop meets zombie apocalypse. Mm. Pretty, pretty much, yeah. I think that basically sums up everything about it, really. Yeah. <laughs> so, as, so as this game goes, this one, this one's a little more hardcore, which which is well, no bad thing. See, it takes the, it takes all sorts. So. This is the thing. I'm assuming because it's Turf War Z, I'm guessing we're going to have all the main players, all the gang members. You're going to well, actually. Do I you know what? If we if we have LAPD. a look, we're going to start seeing them. Yeah. So Ben, who are the starter gangs that we're seeing? Well, well there's the LAPD. They had to be badass, there, didn't they? Yeah, so it starts with um, two gangs effectively as sort of the core of the game, and that's both the LAPD and the Latino gangs as well. There's also the zombies thrown in there, which are sort of a gang onto themselves, but they're also like driven by like a, an inbuilt AI in the game, which mm -hmm. is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, but also they're going to be adding a whole bunch more um, down the line as well. You've got the, like the likes of the bikers, the triads, the yakuzas, and all kind of things like that, mm -hmm. which is cool. Um, one of the things that really sort of drew me into a lot of what they were talking about in terms of the rules, but actually you can you can take a quick look at, is that they've got a whole bunch of different modes of play for this mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So as well as there being um, the standard 1v1 format that you might expect with skirmish games, they're also including big, huge um, ability to sort of play proper big multiplayer games so you can have loads of different gangs on the tabletop, exactly. which is pretty cool. And there's also a solo game mode as well, where you play against the zombie hordes and things, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. so I'm seeing... I'm seeing uh, Clint Eastwood in there. I've Tony Montana. Tony Montana in there. Yep. The, yeah, this yeah. is... Yeah. Oh! Clint, not be missed. <laughs> Hell yes. Okay. It, it is... It, this is your, your, your full-on GTA-esque yeah. kind mm -hmm. of uh, tabletop game here. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, one it's of the got things all that... them kind of tropes it in it. It feels like Sons of Anarchy with, with zombies. 
Yeah, one, one the vibe of, I'm one of the things here? that um, Studio Miniatures has been been doing a lot of recently is they've they've done a, quite a few like sort of homages to sort of films from the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and things like that. And this is sort of like a little bit of a culmination of it in this sort of more dark, well, not dark, but grittier sort of street gang style fighting and things. They've also got other games as well, which are all sort of a bit more sort of aloof and quirky and things with like mm-hmm. zombies and Hollywood icons like, uh, you know, um, the, the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe and all sorts of different things, which is pretty mm-hmm. cool. But yeah, this one's sort of a little bit more gritty and realistic, which I thought was pretty good. Yeah. But, uh, so, yeah, yeah it, it's one. It's like one how many days has it got left, Ben? We were 15 days or 15, something? Yeah. Yeah, it's got about 15 days left. Um, I should also be pointed out as well that um, Mel, the terrain teacher, actually did a really cool video, which I'll link in the description below, mm-hmm. where he actually showed off how to build a modular board for this, oh, which could be right. used for both yeah. this in terms of like zombie games and sort of your, your modern day street fighting. But also if you wanted to you know transport those skills into any other kind of game and any other genre, you can also use that too. But mm. it's worth checking out. So I'll put the video link below for everybody. Fantastic. Cool. Right. Um, that's your lot from me, mm-hmm. but I'm going to let you and John in now because Scale 75 mm-hmm. have some new kind of collectible busts out, and we actually got some of the resins through yeah. um, for you to have a look at. So um, I will call it. I will see uh, any of you guys who come across uh, to backstage uh, tomorrow because uh, well, we're going to have some fun tomorrow. It's mm-hmm. going to be going to be a good crack. <laughs> so um, I will leave you two guys to it. We'll quickly tell you about some hubs. They'll be back to finish the show. A world of hideous nightmares awaits in Kingdom Death Monster. Fight to survive or fade into darkness at the Kingdom Death Hub at BeastsOfWar.com. High Octane Anime Action is the name of the game in Relic Knights. Mount up in your mecha and battle for glory at our Relic Knights Hub on BeastsOfWar.com. Okay, Warren is away, uh-huh. and it's time to talk about one final Kickstarter. The guys yep. at Scale 75 are doing some busts for some very, very beautiful steampunk ladies. Yes, they are, and we have a couple of them here. Yeah, um, we got some sent through, didn't we? We did, we got a couple sent through, and uh, we've been checking them out for a while. But yep. should we pass over to Ben and just have a wee chat about this first? Oh yeah, yeah Ben, uh, can you talk a little bit about what's on the Kickstarter first? Yeah, sure. So uh, they've been putting together this Kickstarter, which is exceptionally well funded. Uh, It's Mm -hmm. coming towards its sort of final days. I think it ends on Monday next week at this point. Uh, But they've got a selection of different busts, as you said, uh, looking at a whole bunch of the different uh, steampunk designs that they've been working on in the past. A lot of them are based on uh, um, some of their existing 75 mil stuff as well. So if you're someone who's been looking at scale 75 for quite a while, maybe you'll recognize some of the characters and things like that. Um, But yeah, they've been doing a whole selection of different uh, characters for you to get stuck into, um, all of them with different styles to them different clothing options different weapons and stuff too so it should be interesting to see what the challenge is when it comes to painting these as hobbyists and stuff mm. yeah i do like the idea that they're also turning these into a 35 mil model actually yeah. having the yeah. full model yeah. as a 35 mil piece is a really really nice touch yeah i mean i have a few models from scale 75 like some of their like we have you got a dwarf back from one of the uh, i think uh, i brought you a dwarf back yeah so i there's one of them and i think i was that was scale 75 so mm. i was checking that out and i was like i've always liked the detail of the models anyway but Getting a, a range of busts in for some of their more interesting characters and their more flavorful characters is quite yeah, well, cool. I, I actually have found my favorite here. Yeah. Say hello to Nancy Steel Punch. <laughs> I like that. That is so steampunk. That that is steampunk Doomfist. Oh dude. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's steampunk Doomfist from Overwatch. That's, yeah. that's totally, totally that. But there's a lot of nice characters in there, especially um it's not Clara McCarthy, it's the other one? Uh, hang on, Clara McCarthy is, is one of the ones we is have the one here. with the rifle, yeah. Yeah, that's Clara McCarthy. The yep. other one is Helga something. Oh, uh, Helga Blitzhammer? Yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. she reminds me very much of like, uh, was it Rosie the Riveter from the Second World War Propaganda? Yeah, it's, it's got that, that very much uh, same pose sort of echoing yeah. through it. Yeah, it's that, that strong female character that's just yeah. getting work done. Mm-hmm. I like that a lot. Very my, cool. my favourite is definitely Mary Reed. I just like the whole sort of pirate vibe to her. I thought, I thought she was pretty awesome. Uh, so yeah. it's good to paint that up and that go there. crazy with some of the stuff yeah. to do with her hair and the dreadlocks and things. It'd be cool. Oh, so. yeah, the dreadlocks actually look really nice. <laughs> yeah. That's a big pistol. Very, that's, very big. Yeah. That's, a ri- that's, that's almost a rifle, but not quite a blunderbuss. <laughs> it's, it's a sawn off yeah. musket. <laughs> it's a sawn off musket. Okay, fair enough. What? It's a sawn-off musket. What? You uh, get sawn-off shotguns, sawn-off musket. <laughs> yeah, but it actually looks a bit better built than that, to be honest. It, true. This, this is the thing I like about this. They've went steampunk, but they've not went so heavily steampunk that it looks silly. Yeah. You know, Although the, the character the tech- you just picked out does have a bionic arm. Yeah, but it's... Or is it a glove? 
It could be a glove. We don't know. It could yet. be a glove. <laughs> but uh, we do have some of them here, and yes, I like the way they've actually done the actual casting on these because mm -hmm. it's very clean, and where the actual join points are is really clever because yep. you're not going to see any seams the way they've done it, I believe. Absolutely. So let's check out the first one. This is Clara McCarthy. Mm -hmm. uh, so she has this awesome looking rifle, mm -hmm. and you you need to paint that with like these little bits glowing or or do some sort of like maybe some kind of alchemical vials ready. Uh, alchemical or electrical. Ah, that could I work. would say, yeah, electrical might suit it. Yeah. Um, we have her, one of her arms has that really nice, oh, what do they call these on the, the top of the arms in that sort of Victorian style? What, a sleeve? The top of the sleeve, it's the shoulder, the the, <laughs> the puffy shoulder bit. The fluffy bit. Epaulets. Epaulets? Would you call them epaulets? I thought that was a military thing for the shoulder boards. No, 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 no it's, uh, it's hard that for the... me to guess what you guys are thinking about. But <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, True. The fluffy bit, we call it. <laughs> yeah. I love the top hat. Yeah. The top hat is gorgeous. These three big feathers on it, and there's a little sort of skull and star mm. thing in there. There's plenty of detail to play with. Mm -hmm. Her expression is cocky confident. Yeah, I'd say I that. I would say cocky confident or very sure of herself. She's, it's, she's it's that clearly, moment of, oh, so you want to fight? Yeah, I mean, she's clearly just come back from a hunt or someone has just offended her and she's like, do you want to try? In fact, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll get a built yeah, one. Yeah, we actually have a built variant. We have built ones too, so I'm going to check that out and see if, mm. yep, yeah, that's the camera. So that's, that's our, our self-confident McCarthy, mm -hmm. and she does look pretty badass. Yeah. I would love to paint this one. We have two. I know. Um, but you can see that the, the sculpting quality, if you take plenty of care around the top hat, that seam should just reduce a little bit as well. Ah, but you see, this is the thing. It, because of where they've placed it and where most people are going to be looking at these from, the sort of angles and stuff, yeah. these are display pieces. You're not going to have someone picking it up, turning it around all over the place. They've been really clever with it. But because it is a display piece, you want to have that extra attention to detail because at wargaming scale, it wouldn't matter. But True. at this scale, it kind of does because you start to break your immersion a little bit when you're looking at something going, mm. that hair is actually sitting not flush to the hat sort of thing. But I, I guess, I guess. But the actual work they've done on the hair, if you swing it around the back, yeah, that yeah. is beautifully done. Isn't it? That is going to be a, an absolute masterpiece to paint in itself. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're good with your highlighting and your shading and stuff like that, that mm -hmm. hair should look absolutely fantastic. Ah, but will you make her blonde brunette or redhead? Um, I think she would really suit a nice sort of auburn hair. She's more, to me, I would paint her up to be more aristocracy. Mm. So she would, I think her hair would be, would suit being like an oak, like a, a oak deep, brown? A deep yeah. brown would look yeah, maybe. pretty good on maybe. that. See, th this is the thing. I'm looking forward to seeing how people paint these because that's the thing with busts. You have the character set in front of you and then everybody's going to imagine that character a little bit differently. Absolutely. Uh, I know you've done a few busts yourself over the years, haven't you? I've, I've done two. Okay. And I still have them. Yeah. Uh, I did one way back in the day. Do you guys remember when Forge World did the Space Wolf one? Yeah. The big angry looking Space Wolf. Yeah, going, yeah it, it took me three weeks to paint and he's still one of my better pieces mm, after all nice. that time. Yeah. Um, oh, but you took such care and attention with it. And probably painted it three or four times at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, but the other one I did was a, a young miniatures one based off War Daddy from Fury. Mm. I oh, that loved, was a beautiful one. I loved painting that. The problem was I was trying to get him to look gritty and dirty because you know in the movie he looks dirty. There's oh, rubbish yeah, yeah, on yeah. his face and stuff. That was the thing about that movie that really threw me for a loop was just how down and dirty everybody blood, was. Blood, mud, and stuff everywhere. Yeah. I couldn't get that right. I had to, <laughs> I had to repaint his face three friggin' times. Really? The uniform right. I nailed the first time, no problem. Because <laughs> I had it in front of me. I had the uniform sat in front of me going, right, that's what that colour is, that's what that colour is. Yeah, but when you, that shaded, you know the uniform like. so well. Yeah. That's and the thing. It, I mean, like, I, I doubt if you sit, you know, just staring at uh, Brad Pitt's face for, you know, however many years. I suppose he's in movies, so you do stare at his face quite when a bit. When did Fury come out? Um, oh 2014. My. Was it? Is 15? it that old now? Was it? it can't be that old. I thought it was 2016 or something. Come no, no, below. it's quite old now. It is quite old now, and I've watched it nearly three times a month since then. Yeah, <laughs> so. and I'm quite sure that every time you come to that tank scene where the tank's bursted, <laughs> the tank's bursted top! Sorry, never mind. <laughs> I'm it getting... does bring up uh, an interesting point, actually, about the sort of way that you paint faces and stuff with this. Because obviously, when it comes to smaller scale miniatures, you just sort of dab down a bit of flesh tone, maybe do a couple of you know highlights here and there. But obviously, with these, 
busts and things you've actually got to look at it more as if you're looking at you know clothing or armor or something you've actually got to look at you know how shading works across the contours of people's faces and stuff too and then in some cases especially if you're going to be taking it to the level you would do with these busts you've got to look at things like makeup and things as well yeah. so it'd be interesting to look at the techniques and stuff that are involved in that but yeah, we well, see you're doing all of it to a completely different scale. Whenever you're doing yeah. wargaming scale, say 28 mil scale stuff, yeah. the shadows can be really, really tight. These you have to be able, maybe a bit broader and a bit softer with the transitions yeah. and stuff. Yeah. So it's a completely different challenge for a painter, which I think is a great thing to do. But it also gives you the chance to add more personality to the model because you know at wargaming scale, you're looking if you're doing an army of anything, you're looking just to get them done. Right. Faces and bases. Face, faces and bases and away you go. Mm. But with this sort of stuff, you can pick it out and you can technically make a lot of creative decisions that the model has mm. left you open to do. Mm -hmm. Like for example, on um, hang on, I'll just I'll just pick her yeah, up. Yeah. So here. well, well, hang on. Let's show the bits first. Right. Show yeah. the components. Okay. okay. So, so we have Helga Blitzhammer. Yep. So this is Helga. Yeah. Now obviously she's wearing a bit of a tighter top. She has this leather sort of cover over one of her arms which is carrying this hammer. Yeah, which kind of makes sense, that's a bit of safety gear. Yeah, uh, I'd imagine she's working in a forge or something like that and yeah. she has big welding mask. big welding mask there and her face. Now she is, she seems a lot happier mm -hmm. than, than Clara. I think it's probably just because someone has just went, hey can I take your picture? And she just quickly went, all right fine, okay, <laughs> lift the mask up and smiled and went, cheese and sort of thing. Yeah. It, it, it actually really is that cheese face. It feels like when they do busts like this, you're you're trying to capture, like a photograph, you're trying to capture a moment in time. Mm -hmm. It's like the person is just about to do something or is just finished doing something mm -hmm. or is giving someone a look or mm -hmm. you know there's an expression in there. But with that, with between these two busts, because both of them have their own expressions, but you could also tell a story between the two of them going, clearly Clara could be aristocracy. Mm -hmm. Helga, Helga's working class. Helga could be working class or she could be just a little bit higher than that. She could be actually a sort of supervisor or something. A supervisor or a foreman or something like that, mm -hmm. something a bit higher up. Well, I suppose if the minions aren't working, slap them with a hammer. But when you <laughs> when you get to bad, that when bad what, what Ben was talking about there, talking about considering shading and makeup and stuff as mm -hmm. well in particular. Yeah. You can look at the aristocracy lady and go, Yes, she needs to have makeup, you know, get like eyeshadow and all yeah, that yeah. sort of stuff on. But with Helga, you can be like, well, she probably wouldn't be wearing makeup in yeah, this situation. Yeah. She's, she's working in a forge. Yeah. So you get to play on that with working on your skin tones. You could even add stuff like freckles in there or uh, blemishes and stuff like a that. A little bit of dirt, oil stains, things like that, smudges yeah. where maybe she's wiped a glove across the top of her forehead, things Very like much that. So. And you can work on that sense of realism and that pushes your creative thought a little bit. Because mm. you can yeah. look at people that work in forges and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And you can go, right, well, how dirty and how sweaty do they get? Yeah, yeah. one of the things that's that always interested me with the the way that you can look at busts as well is that there's always a chance to look at a little bit of freehand work as well when it comes to like the, the idea of tattoos and mm -hmm. stuff. So mm -hmm. especially if you're looking, you know, thinking about Helga, maybe you'd want to like add a bit more of a tattoo to her shoulder or mm -hmm. like across her, her, her stomach or something would be pretty cool. Maybe on her face at the same time, it would be pretty awesome. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just, you know, if you're confident enough to try that kind of thing, you could always work that into your, your painting as well. So. Yeah. And no. if you keep your paints thin, you can just do over it again if you do yeah. it wrong. Yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> Although I do, the worst one thing I want to say about this Kickstarter from the guys at Skill75 is it is really, really closing in on its its last little run on yep. Kickstarter. Yep. So if this is something that this is making you interested in, don't hang about. Actually, no, pause the video, go check it out. Yeah, go and see if there's a, a pledge level you want to jump in on just right before the end. Mm. I haven't shown Helga the built Helga yet. No, you haven't. And so it is beautiful when it's done. Yeah, absolutely. And she is a fantastic, fantastic model. And like I said, that's just pure. Someone's about to take my picture. I better, you know, yeah, pull a pose. I better pull a pose and you know look important. Mm. And I'm trying to figure <laughs> out which way my camera is. There we go, mm. Sandra. But the detailing on the hammer is beautiful as well. Yeah. So if I can. I can't manipulate the, these cameras anymore. There you go. So what is it? Is it a bit of a... It's like a dragon-esque sort of Welsh? It's most likely some form of guild symbol. It looks like a Welsh-esque dragon to me. You know, sort uh, of yeah. four-legged sort of thing, but it also has a bit of knot work on it as well. Mm. So there is that sort of Celtic feel to it. Yeah. So again, that would open up to Ben's suggestion of tattoos. Mm -hmm. So a little yeah. bit of knot work. Yeah. Yeah. We see, this is the thing. Whenever you try and do... Ta do ta uh, words. Whenever you try and tattoo a small miniature... <laughs> mm. 
it's, you're working with very small lines, very fine details. On yep. something bigger like this, you can actually do a bit more work and even shading on those tattoos, maybe yep. even a bit of color in there. Yep. So what I'm going to say in conclusion is this is a lovely kickstart with a beautiful product mm. that will get you some really nice, mm. A, get you some nice display pieces, yep. B, challenge your painting, yep. and C, why not? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the thing. I mean, like, I like these miniatures because they are absolutely beautiful. Mm. The workmanship, the craftsmanship, the detail in these is yep. fantastic. Whoever picks these up is going to have an absolute blast painting them. Yep, you know, exactly. They're going to sit on the shelf when you're done. And if you're anyway half decent, they're going to look absolutely gorgeous. And if you're not half decent, it's yeah, practice good for brush work and stuff like that. Yep. You know, any practice is you. good practice. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, uh, I like it. Thumbs up from me, Ben. Yeah, it's pretty good. Awesome idea for hobbyist collectors to get stuck into. Yeah. And yourself, yeah. John? I'm I'm all for this personally. All right. I'm, I'm going to have to walk away with one of these and try and paint it. Okay. <laughs> well. Uh, Time to close out the show. Seeing as Warren's not here, I'll do his little bit of spiel, which we, we normally go for at the end. Okay. So, <clears throat> guys, that'll close out the show. Uh, tomorrow morning on beastofwar.com, we have another Weekender called the Weekender XLBS, where it'll be myself, Warren, and Ben sitting down again to talk about all things gaming. Uh, we do have a bit of a prize up for grabs from the guys over at Foreground, so if you want the chance to win yourself one of their fantastic HDF forts, the big fort, the, the three, big. three foot by four foot. Oh, this is the Palisade? Ah, oh, Palisade. Huge. It's beautiful. Huge. Yeah. Come across and join us. We do have a seven day free trial if you're curious. And uh, well, hopefully we will move on here and see you there. Bye bye. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And be sure to check out beastofwar.com for the latest gaming news and gaming let's plays. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.